frequency band, this is the uh, lower Rostralin band, this is uh, uh, inverted, right? And so this is just an extreme form of birefringence, but effectively what it means is that the material behaves as a meta uh, metal and a dielectric simultaneously within that spectral range. Now, this is kind of the, exam uh, the required uh, initial description for hyperbolic materials where we start off with a uh, uh, isotropic system. You look at the dispersion relation, and we can say for a uh, given material where all the permittivities are negative and equivalent, I can support an arbitrarily uh, arbitrary direction for my uh, uh, polariton propagation, but only at oops at a fixed wave vector. All right, so if I come in at a fixed frequency, I end up with a fixed wave vector, and thus the polariton wavelength is fixed by the material properties. But again, it can propagate in any dimension of free space. In contrast, these hyperbolic materials, uh, either a type one, where uh, this would be like the lower Rostralin of boron nitride, or the type two, the upper Rostralin band of boron nitride, uh, these give rise to a whole suite of different uh, um, polariton, uh, hyperbolic polaritonic modes, because now you have this hyperbolic shape. So at any given frequency, I can support arbitrarily large wave vectors, which in a finite slab become discrete uh, dispersion branches like here, with each one of these uh, corresponding to a higher momentum, higher wave vector, shorter wavelength mode. But this comes at the cost of fixing the propagation angle. So if I launch the polariton off, say, a gold disk, this is only going to launch straight up uh, at uh, a given frequency. If you change that frequency, the angle of propagation is going to change. And this is from a paper uh, on hyperlensing or, uh, with Thomas Tovner a few years back that I'll speak to in a few minutes. OK, uh, so one more just kind of overview slide. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the people in the audience are familiar with this, but uh, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, within uh, materials like this, you can launch the polariton by uh, scattering uh, light off of an uh, atomic force microscope tip in the form of scattering type scanning near field optical microscope uh, measurements. I borrowed this from Dmitry Basov with his permission because I've tried to make this slide I don't know how many times, uh, and I just can't do it better than this one. So if you look, basically, if I come in with light, I scatter it off of this tip. I create a radial polaritonic wave that's propagating in all directions away from that tip. This is like throwing rock in a, uh, a pond. If instead now, and now if I bring this tip close to a, uh, a high reflecting edge or a gold bar or some other medium where I can have that kind of uh, uh, high reflectivity, something just happened, there we go. Um, I can now get the uh, propagating outward and returning uh, 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 waves to interfere with one another, creating an interference pattern. And thus, if I can then map across this sample surface, for instance, hexagonal boron nitride is shown here, uh, with this AFM, I can map out this polaritonic wavelength uh, by taking a line scan at a fixed incident frequency. And of course, by doing this at multiple different frequencies and extracting the polaritonic wavelength uh, at each of those frequencies, you can then map out the dispersion relation of these systems. Okay, so Moving into real results, one of the things I'm going to start with is uh, begin this talk by looking at uh, hexagonal boron nitride, its sensitivity to some of the environment and some of the more recent results in frequency multiplexing, as well as also in <coughs> uh, uh, enhancing uh, 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 hyperlensing and things of that nature. But then moving into a new material, uh, very low symmetry material in beta gallium oxide, uh, which is monoclinic and gives rise to what we call shear polaritons. Uh, so, one of the surprising things here that I didn't mention is if you look at uh, hyperbolic modes, these polaritons propagate inside the volume of the material, which is in contrast to most hyper, uh, most polaritonic materials where uh, you're going to have the evanescent fields confined to the surface at the interface between the polaritonic material and the surrounding dielectric. Yet despite this volume confinement, the modes are still heavily dependent upon uh, the local environment underneath. So for instance, if I look uh, at the uh, hyperbolic polaritons in two different frequencies traveling in boron nitride, but over quartz, dielectric VO2, or uh, over a suspended region, so basically over air, you can see that the polariton wavelengths are changing quite rapidly uh, and quite a good deal, and thus uh, giving rise to this changing wave vector. Now, this was described in this paper by uh, Dmitry Basov's group, where you can see this wave vector uh, uh, is uh, dependent upon not only the properties of the boron nitride, but also the substrate uh, permittivity. 
Now, one of the challenges, of course, with 2D materials is that if I'm looking at this, uh, you can compare the wave vector and uh, compare the behavior of these uh, uh, platonic modes. But in hyperbolic materials, because of that volume confinement, the wave vector is also thickness dependent. If I change that thickness, I'm changing the uh, 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 total confined volume, and thus the wave vector of that mode will also change. That's this D here. So one of the possibilities is to take that out of this equation and look at the uh, wave vector thickness product that then takes the thickness out of this. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you can quantify uh, how the wave vector is going to change as a function of the substrate permittivity or the real, uh, the magnitude of the, sub, uh, the substrate permittivity. And not surprisingly, if I put the uh, boron nitride on a dielectric substrate, you can see that uh, uh, as I increase that permittivity, as the refractive index increases, that the confinement or the wave vector is going to increase uh, and my confinement is going to increase. So the wave vector is going to shrink. Of course, higher index, this is what you'd anticipate happening. The surprising thing happens when you start looking at a metallic uh, system. Basically, this cuts off the first order mode. And what you find is that uh, you get the highest confinement at a relatively low negative permittivity value. And thus, if you start thinking about now taking substrates where I have a metallic system uh, that has a plasma frequency inside or very close to that of the Rostralum band of your hyperbolic, material, uh, hyperbolic phonon plariton material, simply by injecting free carriers, you can potentially jump across this gap and have very large changes in the refractive index uh, of the substrate uh, by going from a positive um, of the wave vector of your hyperbolic platons because of that refractive index change, basically going from a dielectric to a metallic and back and forth. And so this is something we currently have some results looking at both indium arsenide as well as cadmium oxide, uh, and now currently probing this with ultrafast spectroscopy uh, in the nano FTIR, which should be coming relatively soon. <coughs> now this, of course, uh, a few years back, we were able to use this basic concept and the sensitivity to the local environment to demonstrate that uh, hyperbolic polaritons uh, 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 follow Snell's law, and therefore you can induce refraction of the hyperbolic polaritons. So in this case, what we did was we took dielectric uh, uh, VO2 single crystals. This is a uh, non-latchable phase change material where if you heat it up, you start to induce uh, metallic and dielectric domains during this uh, phase change. These bright areas are uh, correspond to the metallic, dark regions to the dielectric phases. And what you can find is if I look at the platonic wavelength in the boron nitride, as it's propagating over these different regions, these are quite different, uh, different by about a factor of 1.6. And thus, if I launch a polariton off this edge of the crystal into the boron nitride, but then it comes to a domain boundary where uh, uh, between uh, where it's propagating over the dielectric and into the metallic phase, because of that mismatch in the wave vector, you get a uh, refraction of the polariton. And we were able to demonstrate that this follows Snell's law, thus giving rise to the potential to use all of uh, uh, refractive, uh, 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 refractive optics uh, and refractive optic concepts in planar systems uh, that could potentially then be employed for a broad range of different applications. Uh, specifically in the form of reconfigurable metasurfaces. Uh, in that same paper, we proposed that you could use this, especially with GST, which is a latchable phase change material to realize uh, waveguides. Uh, that could be written and rewritten, uh, localized nanostructures, as well as also focusing lenses um, uh, all on a planar surface simply by inducing local domains of metallic and dielectric systems. This is uh, later, whoops, sorry, this, I didn't update this reference, but this is now published, of course. Uh, this is a uh, paper from the Capasso group where they were able to demonstrate experimentally this waveguide concept after this, uh, as well as also demonstrate the uh, uh, lensing uh, behavior within a, a system uh, using GST and boron nitride. Um, but this, one of the things that this really provides is also the concept that I can take uh, a, a localized uh, structure, for instance, silicon photonic architecture, uh, where I have a silicon waveguide, such as this one here, and transfer a, in, uh, a full slab of hexagonal boron nitride or some other hyperbolic medium. And because of the sensitivity to the local environment, potentially uh, control the propagation of the polariton by the underlying pattern structure of the silicon. So basically without having to pattern any of the boron nitride itself. 
Now, one of the things we wanted to look at was could this uh, be induced to actually uh, for, uh, couple to waveguide modes in the mid infrared by just employing this process. And so our first experiment was shown here. It looks like uh, this is just a schematic of this. Here we have the uh, boron nitride platons propagating over air, so it's a very long wavelength. Here it's over bulk silicon, like down here, much shorter wavelength. And as would be anticipated for a waveguide mode, if we look at the platon propagating over the waveguide, we see something between that of the cladding and the core, giving rise to something that looks uh, uh, like a waveguide mode, something in between. If we then map out the frequency dependence of this, we can then validate that this follows the analytical uh, anticipated behavior for waveguide uh, physics, uh, looking at uh, observing that we uh, uh, see two principal modes, the first, uh, the zeroth, and the second order even uh, uh, field distributions for the waveguide mode. There's really no reason that the odd uh, um, symmetry modes couldn't be observed. We believe this is just due to the structure of our geom of the uh, measurement and the actual structures that we're looking at. Um, but that being said, these do follow uh, uh, the anticipated dispersion for a uh, waveguide mode, fall in between that of the hyperbolic platons in the suspended or silicon on silicon variety, uh, showing that this does indeed follow that behavior. And furthermore, it can follow more complicated geometries. So if we launch the player down here, we can induce a, a ring resonant cavity inside this structure that follows a curved system, such as uh, boron nitride on top of this uh, curved structure shown down here. <coughs> now, of course, for this to be useful, uh, it not only needs to be able to guide uh, infrared light, uh, uh, mid-infrared light in the boron nitride, but it has to not negatively impact that of the underlying silicon. And so using electromagnetic simulations, we found that the change in the effective index for uh, the waveguide mode is nominally unchanged, very small variations, uh, as you can see here. And then we actually did some experiments, and we did see that there's a drop in the normalized transmission uh, with the boron nitride present. But if we look at the infrared image at 1550 wave num uh, nanometers, what you can find is that most of the scattering sites are not induced due to the presence of the boron nitride, but due to some degradation of the silicon waveguide itself. And thus it appears through the processing and multiple processing steps that uh, some pitting or other damage to that surface uh, had caused some uh, reduction in the transmission. So this implies that there's really no degradation uh, in the behavior of these uh, waveguides for uh, uh, near infrared propagation, it then offers you the opportunity to propagate mid infrared light with the same effective wavelength um, uh, by controlling the platon propagation characteristics, uh, and therefore giving you the potential for coupling a mid infrared and near infrared signature through frequency multiplexing within the same architecture, really not ex uh, uh, expanding the size of that structure at all. Okay, so now. Just moving to uh, another set of uh, uh, experiments that recently just came out for the group. A few, uh, several years back, uh, working with Thomas Tovner's group, we were able to look at hexagonal boron nitride as uh, a natural hyperlens. Here's some results from that paper. You can see if we take a, a circular structure, a square or a rectangle, that because of the ang uh, frequency dependent angle of propagation, depending on what frequency you're imaging, you can get a complicated field pattern on the top surface that is effectively the uh, 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 some form of an image coming from the scattering off of that structure. So if we look at gold disks here, here's some experimental results at 1400 wave numbers. Um, uh, there's similar work from uh, Sei Wan Dai and uh, Dimitri Basso's group at the uh, same time, uh, looking at different structures. I think I actually have these backward um, for the two images, but. More recently, we were able to take some of the isotopically enriched material and try to really push the limits of this concept. And one of the things that we looked at was to take very small structures here. Uh, this is a, a hyperlens image of a 40 nanometer diameter structure. Uh, this is with naturally abundant. We tried two different uh, SNOM systems. One, we couldn't observe it at all. The other, we were just able to uh, uh, identify it. However, with the uh, isotopic enrichment, which has been shown to improve loss or reduce losses by about a factor of three to four, uh, you can actually get very clean imaging uh, of these systems. 
Plus, if I look at more complicated structures, for instance, this two by two array of 100 nanometer particles with a 25 nanometer gap, I can actually get a much cleaner image of the field pattern that could allow me to then better identify the structure underneath. And if we compare the signal noise level between the natural abundant in black and that of the boron nitride for these structures, you can see a significant improvement, implying that we could actually even get smaller than the structures we imaged here. But even just with that, with that structure, this gives us uh, a demonstration of being able to resolve a 40 nanometer feature, uh, with, which is effectively 154 times smaller than the free space wavelength as well as resolve separations between structures down around 25 nanometers, which is better uh, about 270 times smaller than the free space wavelength. But of course, if I'm looking at these structures, this somewhat looks like the underlying circular pattern. Of course, I have all these additional hot rings from these multiple reflections as shown here. Um, but once I get to more complicated systems like this two by two array or non-circular structures, I'm gonna end up with very complex field patterns that would be very difficult to identify uh, what they are without prior knowledge of uh, what was underneath. And so for this, we uh, coupled in not only with Dimitri Basov's group, but also with Jason Fleischer, uh, who uh, does uh, uh, a great deal of work in image processing. And he and his uh, student, Shara, uh, developed this forward and backward propagation mechanism, um, algorithm, sorry, uh, for basically taking the fields that are imaged on the top surface, feeding those in, taking the dielectric function of the boron nitride and its thickness or whatever hyperbolic material you're using and using field retrieval methods to uh, determine the underlying material structure. What does it look like? What is its shape? What is its size? Uh, and thus um, uh, basically using this to then optimize our understanding of what's underneath without having any prior knowledge of what's there. And here you can see some of the results of that algorithm. These are the experimental SNOM images at four different frequencies. These are electromagnetic simulations of what we would have anticipated seeing to reasonably agree with what we have. Um, but from their algorithm at each of these four different frequencies, uh, the field retrieval method gets the structure of this, uh, the size of the disks and their separations within about 10% independent of what wavelength we look at. Uh, by integrating further, you could actually take all four of these and couple them together to fine tune these results. Um, uh, as well as also uh, being able to then use this retrieval method where you could start to look at this in a, a curved or a metasurface based lensing approach where you could propagate this, uh, these fields into the far field as well without the impl uh, implementation of SNOM. Uh, so hopefully this allows us to move beyond simple architectures and start being able to image uh, complex systems to see if there's any real uh, technological value in the hyperlensing approach for imaging of non uh, of materials that aren't quite so uh, strongly scattering. Okay, so that was uh, a little bit of work with boron nitride. Uh, of course, there's been a great deal of work pushing towards lower symmetry materials. One material that gained a great deal of attention because of it, uh, it provided a natural uh, in-plane hyperbolic material was out of moly trioxide a few years ago. Here's some beautiful work uh, from some of the, uh, uh, one of the organizers here. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, this in-plane hyperbolic response gives rise to ba spectral bands that are elliptical, meaning it can propagate platons in both directions, but they have different wavelengths, or in other bands where the platons are restricted to a single propagation direction. <coughs> Sorry, cold is still killing me. Um, this is akin to alpha quartz. Uh, you can see here uh, the crystal structure for alpha quartz. Uh, it has a rhombic unit cell, it's a uniaxial crystal, uh, and if I look at the uh, uh, isofrequency contours, and here's a surface plot of those isofrequency contours at two different frequencies inside the Rostralin band, you can find that I basically get what you anticipate for an in-plane hyperbolic uh, material, where now the uh, uh, axis of propagation is restricted to one direction, uh, but I can change the wave vector of that propagation uh, by changing the frequency. If instead I move to more complicated crystals, for instance, that of a monoclinic system like beta gallium oxide, one of the things that you find is that because all three principal crystal axes are not orthogonal, uh, one of these axes is uh, the, uh, uh, the B axis is actually about 103.7 degrees rather than 90 degrees. This gives rise to some really strange behavior, right? Effectively, if I look at the isofrequency contours, as I change the frequency, not only does the wave vector change, but the propagation direction is modified and 
this is no longer symmetric about the xy plane as uh, you would anticipate within orthogonal materials. So both crystals are in-plane hyperbolic, right? And they can support hyperbolic surface phonon platons. They can also support volume-confined platons. Whoops. Um, however, if I look at these disper uh, the propagation characteristics, in the case of beta gallium oxide, I have a non-diagonalizable permittivity tensor, effectively because of that non-orthogonal nature of the uh, 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 B axis, there's always, independent of which direction uh, uh, my tensor is pointing, I always have some contribution from the X and Y leading to these off-diagonal terms. This has implications both for the real part as well as the imaginary part, right? And so if I look at this, this leads to these non-symmetric wave fronts as shown here. It also gives rise to the fact that this polariton wavelength and its propagation direction are going to disperse with frequency. And so that means the direction at which the uh, uh, polariton, polariton is going to propagate on the surface is going to rotate in the plane as uh, uh, the uh, incident frequencies change throughout the Rastrala band, which is directly in contrast to what you see in uh, uh, materials such as alpha quartz and molytrioxide. So not only does this define the direction, but it also uh, control, uh, define the wavelength that also controls the direction. <laughs> it also, uh, because of the fact that the losses in alpha quartz are symmetric, this leads to uh, very uh, well-defined wave fronts as shown here. However, what you find because of the off-diagonal imaginary contributions to the uh, permittivity tensor, you actually get this shear upon the propagation and leading to uh, a tilted wave fronts as seen in this case, which will also continue to induce this rotation of the propagation direction at, uh, for the hyperbolic modes as you shift through frequency space. So this gives rise to what we refer to as these hyperbolic shear polaritons, uh, beta gallium oxide serving as an exemplary material in this regard, but this is general to a, uh, the class of monoclinic crystals. Uh, as well as also lower symmetry, potentially in triclinic crystals. Uh, we wanted to demonstrate this experimentally. So uh, in uh, collaboration with Alex Parman's group at Fritz Haber Institute, uh, as well as also Tia Schubert at uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln and Andrea Liu and Tom Foland, uh, we performed some auto configuration measurements uh, and then mapped out uh, the azimuthal dependence of the polaritonic response. So this is for alpha quartz. You can see it's symmetric about 90 degrees, as you'd anticipate. But again, because of these tilted wave fronts in this uh, 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 non-symmetric crystal structure, this uh, falls apart and you do not get symmetric behavior within the dispersion when you rotate the crystal azimuthally about uh, the incident angle. And so there's no mirror symmetry in that dispersion. <clears throat> God. So to then map this out more directly, we looked in a very narrow spectral range for one of these bands, and we performed both the azimuthal dependence, uh, but at the same time also the incident angle dependence to track out this full dispersion. This is a heroic uh, experiment by uh, 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 Alex's student, uh, Julia, where, and uh, uh, former student, uh, um, Nikolai, where they looked at the angle dependence, uh, the incident angle dependence, a bunch of different azimuthal uh, wavelengths, uh, I'm sorry, azimuthal angles, and you can see the dispersion relation, and then we can map out the in-plane momentum versus azimuthal angle and contrast that with what we'd anticipate from uh, the uh, off-diagonal, uh, uh, in the induced changes in the permittivity tensor due to those off-diagonal terms, and you can see this agrees quite well, and it shifts and rotates with the Cartesian coordinates. Moving to the next steps, we've then uh, exfoliated crystals of uh, 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 hexagonal born, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, beta gallium oxide. Sorry, brain fog from cold still getting me. Uh, it's actually a relatively interesting uh, uh, material. It's not really a two dimensional material in the right that uh, it has Van der Waals bonds holding it together, but on the uh, side uh, of the uh, uh, of the side on of the crystal, like if you go to the flat of the wafer. You can use the same exfoliation methods to peel off thin flakes uh, with a different crystal orientation, uh, where basically your C axis is uh, now in plane with your V axis and A is out of plane. This removes some of that uh, uh, symmetry breaking because now the monoclinic plane is no longer, a monoclinic axis is no longer in the plane. 
but you can still look at some significant, uh, uh, significantly exciting uh, changes in the dispersion relation, both as a function of thickness. You can see here from going 200 nanometer thick to 1,000 nanometer thick, uh, how the variations in the platonic dispersion arise across these multiple Strongland bands. <clears throat> We were able to uh, initially probe this. Uh, here's some synchrotron SNOM results that we got uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. You can see uh, this platonic dispersion both down here and down here. We're currently performing some additional experiments in my lab right now. Um, but more importantly, you can then look at the uh, azimuthal dependence, basically rotating the sample with respect to the incident light again. And you can start to see some really interesting behavior of strong coupling and anti-crossings as well as direct coupling between platonic branches, uh, corresponding to uh, uh, modes aligned with the various principal axes. Right. So as I'm rotating from zero to fifteen, I'm getting both x and y, or I'm sorry, um, the c and b axis participating at the same time, giving rise to these very interesting behaviors uh, that we're currently trying to probe, um, and hopefully we'll be able to look at soon in collaboration with Lucas uh, Eng down at, uh, in Dresden on the synchrotron SNOM, I'm sorry, the uh, free electron laser SNOM. Uh, so with that, I would just point out that, of course, I showed you some of the scattering type scanning near field measure. Uh, this is a pretty broadly applicable tool that a lot of people have. We also have uh, nano FTIR now, but one of the key additions that we've just added is we have an uh, ultraviolet 390 nanometer pump uh, or a 1560 near infrared pump uh, it's about 130 femtoseconds that allows us to do uh, time resolved pump probe measurements of nano FTIR, basically 20 nanometer spatial resolution following an ultraviolet pulse. Uh, it's a pretty unique uh, capability, and we're currently probing and using this for a lot of semiconductor uh, experiments in my lab. Uh, but I think there's a broad potential applicability to a number of different fields. Um, so, with that, I'll just thank my group. <clears throat> A former postdoc, Tom Folland, who's now at University of Iowa, was critical to pretty much all of the work uh, and is a, a, a co-author on the uh, beta gallium oxide paper that's being finalized for publication now. Uh, Ryan uh, just, uh, just graduated last year. Most of the uh, experiments presented today were performed by Joseph Madsen and uh, predominantly by Ming Jahi. Uh, of course, now that COVID's starting to wind down, uh, hopefully we can all start traveling again. I'd lo uh, love to have visitors, always looking for new additions and collaborators. So if uh, 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 the opportunity arises, uh, please let me know. Of course, wouldn't be anywhere without funding from NSF, uh, the Army, as well as the Office of Naval Research. And then I have the opportunity to work with some fantastic colleagues uh, and collaborators. Uh, this is just an overview of uh, the folks that I've been collaborating with over the years. I'm sure I've missed some, but certainly those that have participated in this work here. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for the attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. <coughs> thank you very much, Josh. Amazing talk. Also, thank you very much for the new results. Fascinating. So for sure, we have some questions from the audience. Do we have some questions? Sorry for all the coughing, by the way. <laughs> okay. Question. Um, thanks for the nice talk. I I'm a bit curious about the uh, polarity and light time uh, regarding the gallium oxide uh, results that you show. Uh, maybe I missed it, but can you comment a bit on that? Uh, yeah. So we actually have not been able to directly measure those in the lifetimes yet. Um, right now, we're limited by the line width of the spectral measurements. Um, and so it's clearly good um, as far as uh, uh, on the order of picoseconds. Uh, I don't have any reason to believe that it's going to be you know, tens of picoseconds, but I can't give you outside of looking at the, you know, the damping constant from the dielectric function, which would imply something on the order of a couple of picoseconds, depending on which band you're in. Um, I wouldn't expect any differences from that, uh, but we don't have direct measurements of the Plariton lifetime yet. <clears throat> and also, which is the smallest thickness you can get with this material? I'm sorry, I missed what you said. The the the, the thinner layers that you can get with, with this material, I, I remember was around one micron. Uh, depends on how much patience you have. 
<laughs> um, we've gotten down to 200 nanometers. Uh, I've seen papers in the literature uh, where it's usually in the order of a few hundred nanometers uh, to a micron. Uh, I've seen a couple people talk about much thinner material uh, down in the tens. We have not had success getting down there. Um, it's also a pretty robust material. It's actually mostly used right now and uh, is a developing power electronic material. And so fabrication processing, uh, etching and things like that have been developed. So we're also in the process of trying to define the thickness that we want by uh, using uh, uh, etching processes and then following with the needles. I don't know what damage that's going to do to the surface from the perspective of optics, but it certainly works for electronic devices uh, without any significant degradation. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. So are there any other questions? Maybe from in the chat, do you have any? You could type, by the way, those who are connected online, please type your questions in the chat also during the next talk. So if, if nobody has, I have a small question, uh, Josh, maybe it's a nice or stupid question, but when you were showing this reconstruction of the object in your hyper lenses, can you reconstruct it mathematically by applying an operator, right? And yep. By observing this pattern with an, an operator, and you could reconstruct the object which is illuminated. But can you make uh, nature working for you? I mean, can you imprint this pattern somehow using phase, phase change material or whatever? And then, like, in holography, you illuminate from top. Or oh, you use um, the, and then you, you can you observe on the opposite side this object? I mean, is it reciprocal? This imaging? Um, that's actually a good question. Uh, I wouldn't, and if you match the hyperbolic, well, not necessarily matched, if you had a hyperbolic material. For instance, if you expanded this into the, the far field, um, or if you then match this to a hyperbolic system on top where you then uh, redirected the image into a meta lens or something, perhaps. Uh, it's not something I have thought of. I know Jason Valentine and I have been talking a good bit about uh, infrared holograms uh, and design of the uh, uh, phase masks and amplitude masks to do that. Um, that's actually a really good question, Alexi. I, I don't. I'd need to think a bit more of it. Um, I don't have an answer for you right now, though. Okay, it would be interesting to explore this possibility. Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you for the opportunity, and sorry I can't be there with everybody. Hope to have you next time. <coughs> so we we continue with the program. The next speaker would be Monica Rauschen. I, I hope I pronounced well from the University of Exeter. Uh, can you hear us, Monica? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear? Hello. Hello. So please, please share your screen and the poll is yours. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Just make it maybe full screen. Is it okay? Uh, just, just a second. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, can you see also my pointer? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, can I start? Yeah, please. All right, so yes, uh, thank you uh, for, uh, uh, to the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me to give a talk on our uh, recent work on uh, electrical tuning of uh, interlayer excitons in uh, 2D uh, bilayer semiconductor materials. And also uh, thank you for uh, this uh, organization of this hybrid 
conference that uh, can allow uh, those of us that cannot travel to, to be with uh, everyone. So I am uh, joining from uh, the UK, from the University of Exeter, and uh, I am part of the engineering department uh, at Exeter and also uh, part of um, uh, two centers. One is a center for uh, graphene science and uh, a center for uh, research and innovation in metamaterial. And as part of uh, uh, the research group in our engineering department, uh, we are focused on uh, uh, nanoengineering, uh, science, and uh, technology. Uh, okay, so uh, across uh, uh, the past decade at Exeter, we have uh, had uh, uh, various uh, funding which have enabled us to uh, build uh, on research on uh, uh, graphene and uh, in general uh, 2D materials. And so um, we, we have a center for graphene science, but also uh, focusing uh, now more and more on other 2D materials. And uh, uh, our uh, main aim is to, uh, so we work across physics, engineering, the material science, chemistry, and also a little bit of bioscience, and uh, looking to um, do uh, scientific development in these areas, but uh, also to bridge the gap between uh, this development Developments uh, that are very exciting in, in the scientific areas and applications in uh, various sectors such as electronics, optoelectronics, photonics, energy, and, and so on. So, um, in, uh, uh, in the past uh, years, uh, the discovery of uh, 2D, two dimensional uh, semiconducting uh, materials such as uh, transition metal. Uh, the, chalcogenides, uh, they have uh, brought us uh, the possibility to uh, study and utilize exciton physics at higher uh, temperature than in traditional bulk uh, semiconductors. And this is uh, due to the fact that this um, uh, 2D materials, they have an excitonic uh, binding energy that exceeds the uh, room temperature uh, thermal energy. So that allows us to, to study uh, this uh, exciton physics at, at higher temperatures. So, and uh, um, across the years, uh, there were many demonstrations uh, uh, regarding the unique dependence of the photophysical properties into the uh, TMDC material, for example, as a function of uh, electrostatic doping, it has been uh, shown uh, that it's possible to control by electric field the uh, neutral air and charge excitons in monolayers, TMDC, such as uh, monolayer MOS2, uh, the electrical control of uh, valley excitations in uh, uh, monolayer uh, tungsten diselenide. Uh, apart from um, from this, um, sorry, I'm just trying to move this. Yeah, so apart from, from the uh, electrical control, also the uh, dielectric environment uh, could be used to, um, uh, to control these uh, photophysical properties. And uh, uh, this is summarized over here. So it has been first theoretically predicted that uh, it's possible to, to control the uh, band gap and uh, uh, the excitons uh, binding energy with the dielectric environment. And it has been uh, also shown experimentally, uh, including uh, some results from uh, our group. And finally, um, uh, also, uh, we can control the uh, and engineer the photophysical properties by means of uh, 2D uh, heterostructure. So in this uh, type of systems, uh, there were reports of um, uh, various uh, um, observation of uh, 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 long live uh, interlayer excitons, uh, moire excitons, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so in uh, in this uh, in this uh, type of um, uh, two D uh, heterostructure, it is also possible to uh, control uh, by means of an electric field the interlayer excitons, 
and uh, um, it, it has been demonstrated by various groups, but uh, um, crucial to all these uh, discoveries that have been reported is the need to uh, precisely control the rotation angle between uh, these two uh, distinct uh, monolayers uh, that form the heterostructure while uh, at the same time retaining the high quality of, uh, uh, of the interface. On the other hand, if we look at um, uh, naturally formed uh, uh, bilayers or so-called homo bilayers that uh, are uh, found in uh, 2D uh, uh, TMDC. So in, in this case, both the top and the bottom layers uh, um, in some cases are rotated by 180 degrees, which enables to restore the inversion symmetry and uh, can provide a, uh, a simpler system to explore the physics of uh, such uh, interlayer uh, excitons. So in... Uh, um, in uh, two, uh, this naturally formed uh, homo bilayer consisting of uh, uh, 2H bilayer TMDCs, that there have been recent theoretical work that has predicted that uh, uh, this um, uh, interlayer excitons in bilayer MOS2, uh, they are in fact uh, hybrids uh, of uh, pure. Uh, so you have a mixed interlayer exciton state, which uh, it's a hybrid between a charge transfer state of, uh, of the A exciton uh, over here and uh, uh, intralayer states of, uh, of the B character. So this, uh, uh, this mixed uh, interlayer exciton, uh, in fact, they uh, possess a larger uh, oscillator strength when uh, we compare with the pure uh, uh, interlayer excitons in uh, heterobilayers. And uh, because of this, we should be able to uh, directly observe them uh, up to room temperature as well as um, we should have the electric field control and manipulation of uh, um, of this. So um, to to test this, we have uh, come up with uh, this kind of uh, structure. So we have uh, a device consisting of um, uh, bilayer uh, MOS2. And uh, uh, to apply electric fields, we have um, uh, as a gate dielectric hexagonal boron nitride on the top and on the bottom, and um, as a gate electrode, a few layer graphene. And these are then uh, contacted by uh, chromium gold um, metallic leads. So over here, you can see the um, uh, optical image of this uh, heterostructure. So in red here, it's the uh, bilayer MOS2. Uh, then we have the HBN here, uh, and then uh, the graphene uh, electrodes, the top and the bottom, and they are connected to um, uh, uh, gold um, uh, contacts. So uh, here we show the uh, differential uh, uh, reflectant contrast here of uh, the bilayer uh, MOS2. And um, uh, this is at room temperature. So we have two uh, features at um, uh, 187 uh, and uh, 205 that correspond to the A and B uh, here, um, intralayer excitons that are arise from uh, the direct um, optical transitions between uh, um, the spin orbit split bands. And then in addition to to this A and B, we observe uh, the formation of the intralayer excitons. And um, uh, in the case of um, intralayer uh, A and B excitons here, uh, electrons and holes reside mostly within the same layer. And uh, uh, the uh, difference in energy between them, it's about 130 milli electron volts owing to their uh, a spin valley coupling of, uh, of the valence band and the uh, intralayer hybridization. 
Uh, by contrast to this, uh, the inter, um, interla interlayer exciton is formed by a hole in the uh, valence band of uh, uh, layer one and the uh, electron uh, in the conduction band of the layer two with, with the same spin. And at the same time, a spin down uh, interlayer uh, exciton with the same energy, but with a, a whole electron distribution opposite to the spin up um, uh, exciton also uh, exists. And over here, we show a specially resolved map of the differential reflectivity uh, in the um, uh, special in the spectral uh, region of the A uh, excitons, which uh, confirms the uh, um, presence of this exciton over the whole uh, device area. And uh, um, In here, we, uh, we show the um, low temperature, so 4 Kelvin reflectance uh, contrast uh, spectrum as a function of uh, the perpendicular electric field, which is calculated using this, uh, this formula here, where um, we have uh, uh, VB is the bias voltage and uh, T is the thickness of uh, the HBN dielectric, which in our case, it's about 55 uh, nanometers. And uh, epsilon is the dielectric constant of, uh, of the component material. So either HBN or uh, the TMBC. Um, so uh, we, um, we see that, uh, um, this uh, interlayer exciton um, that is at about 1.99 uh, electron volts evolves into uh, two distinct uh, excitations here when uh, uh, a perpendicular electric field is applied. And the uh, strong dependence uh, of this uh, interlayer exciton uh, um, on the electric field is in stark contrast to the um, a lack of any electric field dependence that uh, uh, A and B excitons uh, ha uh, don't have. Yes, so uh, to, to resolve the spectral feature more clearly of this uh, um, uh, interlayer excitons, we have, uh, we show here a map of the second derivative of, of this reflectance uh, uh, contrast spectrum as a function of uh, the electric field. Uh, that uh, it's basically this uh, dashed uh, box here. And uh, uh, we can clearly see that at non-zero uh, electric, uh, non-zero perpendicular electric field, this uh, splits, uh, this uh, uh, exciton splits into two um, peaks that we uh, call IL1 and uh, uh, IL2. So uh, as uh, basically the electrons and holes reside now in, in different layers, these uh, excitons are expected to possess an electric dipole uh, that is oriented out of the crystal plane. And uh, so the, um, their energy should exhibit a linear dependence on the electric field. So this, um, uh, this is clearly observed uh, here. So this is extracted from the second derivative uh, from this map of the ref uh, reflectance contrast spectrum. And uh, from this uh, relationship where uh, uh, D is the distance between the center of mass of, uh, of the charges forming the exciton, um, we estimate this effective electron hole separation of uh, this exciton to be about 0.4 nanometers. So this is quite a, a large separation, but also is well below the layer layer distance that is about uh, 0.6 nanometer, which suggests that um, an exciton of mixed uh, um, uh, IL1 and IL2 character uh, its form. And uh, sur surprisingly, uh, we, this electric field control of the uh, interlayer exciton persists up to uh, room temperature. So uh, we have here the data at 4 Kelvin, and this is at room temperature, which indicates uh, an oscillator strength larger than uh, the pure um, 
uh, interlayer excitons that have been reported in uh, uh, hetero bilayers. So to, to gain more insight into uh, the nature of the observed uh, excitonic states, our collaborators, uh, Thorsten uh, and Christian, have performed uh, some uh, ab initio calculations that are shown here of the optical absorption spectrum of uh, such uh, system that we have, the encapsulated uh, MOS2 bilayer into um, a hexagonal boron nitride. So their calculation shows that uh, at, at zero field here, uh, we have uh, basically the, uh, we find a twofold uh, degenerate uh, A and B, um, A and B exciton. And uh, um, the first peak uh, IL here has uh, a large uh, oscillator strength, while the second peak uh, is much, uh, uh, much weaker. Um, so um, as the field, uh, electric field increases, the strength of the electric field, uh, the interlayer uh, exciton and uh, B uh, exit B peaks split into double peaks. So this is indicated by this red uh, and blue points here. And um, uh, we also uh, summarize this energy dependence of uh, uh, these different excitons and compared to the measurements uh, it is shown uh, over here. Um, so this is uh, the electric field dependence of the second derivative of, uh, of the reflectance constant uh, uh, spectra uh, superimposed uh, on the uh, theoretical calculation. So this uh, uh, observed um, uh, again linear stark shift of these uh, interlayer peaks is a direct uh, consequence of the uh, relative shift in the band energies of the two MOS2 layers that is produced by the electric field, which also changes the uh, bind alignment to a type two uh, bind alignment that, uh, that we have. So according to uh, the calculations, the uh, degenerate uh, B interlayer exciton mix with the two uh, charge transfer A excitons with uh, electron and hole fully separated into two layers layers to produce the four uh, mixed uh, interlayer excitons that we denote here as uh, uh, IL1, 2, and uh, uh, B1 and 2. Okay, so finally, um, uh, we demonstrate uh, that uh, the electric field response of the interlayer exciton over uh, takes place over the whole area of the device. And for this, we uh, perform high resolution spatial maps of uh, uh, this second derivative um, uh, of um, differential reflectivity at uh, uh, the energy corresponding to the IL0 excitons. Uh, uh, that is 1.992 electron volts. So we, uh, we have this is at uh, zero um, bias voltage, and this uh, map shows at uh, 3.5 uh, volts uh, uh, bias voltage. So at zero um, electric field, uh, we see this IL0 exciton that appears throughout the whole device area, which is about um, um, uh, 20 by 30 microns. Uh, while we, when we apply a perpendicular electric field in here, uh, the signal from this IL0 exciton uh, completely vanishing upon uh, applying the perpendicular field. And uh, this leads to uh, the em emergence of uh, IL1 exciton here at 1.975 uh, uh, um, electron volts and uh, IL2 uh, about 2.007 uh, electron uh, volts. So uh, even despite the presence of inhomogeneities that um, uh, 
we can have in the interlayer distance that uh, can be caused by unwanted uh, bubble that are form the interface uh, during the transfer process, uh, we can still see these uh, uh, spectral signatures of the two IL-1 and IL-2 excitons uh, over a large um, uh, surface area of at least uh, 15 by 25 uh, micrometers. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we show that uh, the electric modulation of optically active excitons uh, is possible in bilayer uh, MOS2. And the application of a perpendicular electric field uh, can create a uh, type two band alignment, um, uh, which uh, can cause the uh, um, the generate exciton to split with large uh, and opposite uh, uh, stark shifts. We have also um, uh, looked at uh, calculation to uh, to trace the field induced splitting of this several excitons peak and to um, it's basically due to mixing of uh, intralayer B exciton with interlayer A excitons and this explains the significant optical response of all, all the excitation excitons which makes them clearly observable uh, in the reflectance measurements. So this uh, uh, rich spectrum is consistently observed over a large um, spatial region of, uh, of an area of about 20 by uh, 30 uh, micrometers. So uh, such uh, naturally stacked uh, TMDC by layer provide uh, a powerful platform for uh, optically active and electrically tunable um, interlayer excitons with long uh, lifetime that can be operated at uh, high temperature. So this would uh, provide new opportunities for uh, uh, 2D optoelectronics, electronics, and so on. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank uh, our team and collaborators who, who have contributed to this work. So in uh, the University of Exeter, um, our uh, postdocs and PhD students that have uh, contributed, uh, uh, in particular Nam Fung uh, Pei Miu, who, who has done most of this work, and uh, in physics, uh, uh, Saverio Russo and uh, Freddy Witters, as well as our collaborators on the uh, theory side, uh, Christian and uh, Thorsen, as well as um, our collaborators from Japan who have provided uh, the um, uh, uh, hexagonal boron nitride for enabling us to, to produce these devices. And thank you uh, all for listening. Thank you very much, Monica. Very interesting talk. So we have you. quite a few talks in this conference about excitons. I guess people might be very interested. Do we have questions? Hi, uh, thanks Hello. for the nice talk. I have a question regarding the experiment in theory comparison. So you have like some asymmetry in the negative part of the applied field in the uh, in your uh, system. So I just want to, I was just uh, wondering how what the reason let's say. Sorry, can you uh, can you repeat? On the previous slides where you showed the dependence of the field on the yes here. So he there is some asymmetry, no? So you don't see a clearly linear or bilinear dependence changes as applied negative and positive. So I just wonder what the reasons behind it. Ah, uh, Yes, so uh, we we only uh, looked at uh, so yeah there is some uh, device uh, asymmetry in uh, in this yeah the um, uh, top and bottom uh, um, uh, yeah, gate dielectrics are not uh, exactly the same so that can lead to some asymmetry in the data. Okay, so it's no more stark shape. But
So, uh, sorry, if it parentheses, so the thickness of the HBN. So the thickness of the HBN, it's about uh, uh, 50, um, 55 uh, plus minus uh, uh, 15, uh, no, 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 yeah, plus, uh, 55 plus minus 1.4 nanometer, um, the thickness of the HBN. Thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? Let's check in the chat. So, some questions for me. Monica, did, did you try to introduce some scattering centers into your heterostructure? Like, I don't know, small nanoparticles or some dipole antennas, and if not, how, how do you think the results would change? Would it affect the oscillators when the exotonic? Uh, uh, yeah, we we didn't uh, uh, we didn't uh, um, introduce any any scattering in there. So, uh, so you mean in between? Uh, uh, so if we introduce this in between the layers and uh, and the HBN, uh, probably it will affect maybe the distribution of the electric field um, uh, in in the across the surface of uh, uh, of this material. And uh, uh, the material itself, it's a uh, bilayer, uh, so it's it's not too. Uh, hetero, by, uh, it's, it's not like two monolayers that are placed on top of each other from the same material. So it's directly exfoliated as a bilayer material. So if uh, if it was uh, like two separate layers, probably uh, it is difficult to to align them. Uh, um, for the degree that uh, we are interested here. Okay. I see, I was just wondering whether this could have some polarization. So, you know, because the non antenna could have the polarization of the field in some direction. Yeah, it's not a So, uh, anyway, thank you very much. If we don't have any further questions? Let, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks a lot, Monica. Thank you. And we proceed to the program. So the next speaker would be Luca Santa Viglia from National Lab of Berkeley. So Luca, are you here? Are you connected? Uh, yeah. Thank you. So. so then, Please try to share your screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm Luca Francavilla. I'm a postdoc at um, the Molecular Foundry at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, California. You see here uh, an image of our building. In, uh, in my talk today, I'd like to, to tell you about um, our study and in particular, how we focused on trying to optimize the mapping of uh, TMD, TMD transition method of colchogenide uh, monolayers when they are encapsulated in HPN. So our focus will be on these kind of materials, but I want to stress that we believe that um, we can expand the, the application, the scope of our study also to different kinds of uh, nanomaterials that have some optical response when they are buried under some um, layer of, uh, in particular, HPN, for instance. So anyway, since we focus mainly on TNDs, let's have a, um, let's talk about a couple of things that um, I want to highlight about these materials. So we all know that with uh, uh, TNDs, we have uh, plenty of interesting properties that uh, uh, emerged in the recent years. But there is something that is quite important to uh, keep in mind, and that's the that um, with the TMDs, 
we have uh, a strong sensitivity to some form of uh, heterogeneity. Uh, this can be, for instance, structural defects, for instance, and they can be useful if you want to do catalysis, just to give an example. Some other forms of defect can be used as a single photon emitters, and this is great. And we also have uh, further, further degrees of freedom in the modulation of the excitons or band gap, let's say, of these materials when we can uh, make uh, hydrostructures with them and uh, then uh, make uh, what is known as a more super lattice. So we have different forms of um, variations of the properties. They can be hopefully uh, functional and beneficial, like in these cases, and some other times they, they can actually be detrimental to the properties, to the optoelectronic properties of uh, the device and the, the TMD. What's really important to understand in both cases is that uh, this kind of heterogeneity happens to be at the nanoscale. So it is also important to have the right tools to map this uh, heterogeneity with the right uh, special resolution. And a, a very common example is uh, near field optics, where you can use a, a tiny probe, a nanoscale probe, to map different uh, forms of uh, changes in brightness or shift in the emission from uh, a specific device. However, at the same time, we also know that uh, TMDs are really sensitive also to the outer environment. So on top of uh, some form of intrinsic heterogeneity, they are also very sensitive to perturbations, for instance, in the, the surrounding dielectrics. And this is the reason why it's now really common to encapsulate uh, TMDs in a hexagonal boronitride so that we can isolate the, the TMD from the environment and have high, high quality devices. However, this comes also with the problem that uh, the encapsulation in HBN is limiting the access from a probe, like a near field, uh, a tip for near field spectroscopy. It's limiting the access of that probe to the buried uh, TMD, buried under some layers of uh, HBN. And this is the reason why we decided to focus mainly on cathode luminescence. So in this way, we are exciting the whole heterostructure using a beam of accelerated electrons. So we are able to access the whole thickness, let's say, of the HBN TMD heterostructure. But at the same time, we can also focus our probe, our electron beam, in a nanoscale spot that, in principle, is uh, um, allowing us to have nanoscale spatial resolution. I also want to just give you one last comment on the technique. When we use, a, we do cathode luminescence on HBN TMD heterostructures, the HBN encapsulation is actually useful because this is the place where most of the electron matter interaction happens. So we generate most of the electrons and holes in HBN, and then they can flow into the TMD and uh, excite the TMD on uh, its own energy levels. So with this broad introduction, uh, let's go into uh, the study that we have done. We wanted to have, a, first of all, a systematic understanding of what, what limits the spatial resolution or how can we, uh, we can control the spatial resolution of cathode luminescence of uh, HBN encapsulated TMDs. And to do that, uh, we relied on a fairly common concept in uh, imaging, which is the edge response. This means that uh, when you have a very well-defined sharp edge in your sample, for instance, then you can just image that sharp edge and see how blurred it looks like in, uh, in your images. So we just took advantage of the atomically defined edge of TMD monolayers. And you see here, for example, on the left, uh, the TMD signal from uh, an MOSC2 monolayer at low temperature. So we just took several images like, uh, like uh, this one, and uh, we then crossed the, the edges of the monolayer, like in the line scan here. And the result is, uh, for instance, like uh, this image on the, on the right, where we see the increase of the brightness going from uh, uh, the noise level to the maximum. And uh, what we decided to do was to take a, a systematic definition of this edge response, so this blurring of the sharp uh, transition that gets some broadening, and uh, we use this definition. So we always took the distance between these two positions from which the, the signal goes from 10% to 90% of the overall intensity. 
So you can do that for several uh, curves of several line scans uh, in your sample. In, the, in this way, you can gain some statistics. But you can also uh, do that for several uh, samples. We always kept the same configuration for all our samples with the same substrate, uh, relatively thin bottom HBN. And then what we chose to do was to vary the thickness of the top HBN layer. So going from 20 nanometers to about uh, 330 nanometers. In this way, if you get that statistics on uh, several uh, line scans and distinguish according to the thickness of the HBN in each sample, you obtain a curve like this one, where you observe that the edge response is uh, as a function of the HBN thickness is uh, constantly a monotonically increasing or an increase uh, of uh, HBN thickness. And this is for a given acceleration voltage. So this graph is already very useful if you want to do mapping of the optical response of some HBN encapsulated TMD, because you realize that uh, for any increase of HPN thickness, you have a, a worsening of the spatial resolution using the edge response as your metric for spatial resolution. On top of that, uh, it would be nice, to, it would be useful to understand why this happens. So let's have a look at the mechanism of uh, generation of uh, this edge response. So the first idea is that uh, we need to understand what's the, the actual size of our probe. So we have our nanoscale uh, focused uh, electron beam on the surface of the sample, but then uh, it, it's nowadays quite uh, straightforward to simulate the size uh, of the electron interaction volume in your material. So the volume within which you actually have scattering of your primary electrons in HBN, and then look at the size of this uh, interaction volume. So this is an example using the software uh, Casino. Uh, these are Monte Carlo simulations where we look at the energy deposited in a HBN for a 3 kV electron beam. And what we see is that uh, we have a lot of the, the energy of the electron beam that is already deposited within very few tens of nanometers from the HBN uh, surface. And even radially, uh, the uh, localization is even stronger. So we have a, a tiny probe in uh, uh, HBN due to the first interaction of electrons. And uh, to justify why here we observe uh, relatively large edge responses, then we have to take into account something else. And this is usually um, something that comes from the diffusion of the charge carriers that you generate within the interaction volume. This diffusion can be pretty long. So, or anyway, longer than the, the actual size of the uh, smaller interaction volume. So, if we look, for instance, at the mechanism of generation of this uh, edge response, we can consider our electron beam, the interaction volume, and then we have to consider that the charge carriers have the possibility to travel a long distance away from the interaction volume. In this way, when the electron beam is hitting some position that is not yet on the TMD, for instance, then already some charge carriers are able to reach the TMD and start to increase the luminescence coming from the TMD itself. So we have a broadening of the otherwise ideally sharp uh, step function at the, the TMD edge. So we understand that, first of all, that the edge response comes from diffusion. So we have a, an overall probe size that is given by the sum of a small, almost negligible size of the interaction volume plus a, a pretty large uh, diffusion volume. And on top of that, uh, we can also consider what happens when we have a thicker HBN. So from our measurements, we see that the TMD is a very efficient sink for charge carriers in HBN, meaning that as soon as uh, charge carriers reach the interface between HBN and TMD, then these uh, charge carriers are trapped uh, in uh, TMD and their journey in, uh, in HBN uh, stops there. So, when we increase the thickness of HBN, we allow these uh, charge carriers to uh, travel a longer distance and uh, they have multiple paths that they can follow before they reach the interface with the TMD. So we also understand that effectively changing the size, uh, the thickness of HBN, we are increasing the size of the diffusion volume. And this is the reason why we observe that increase in edge response. So in other words, uh, we are tuning the spatial resolution of the technique, changing the thickness of HBM. 
This is not so unusual, I'd say, in nanostructures. But what's interesting here is that uh, changing the overall size of the hydrostructure, we're not changing the properties of the active material, so the TMD. And this is in contrast what, with what you usually happen to have when you deal with other nanostructures, where typically changing the size of a nanowire, a quantum dot, then you change the, the actual optical properties of, uh, of the material that you're studying. We can also do something more with this uh, diffusion volume. So, I got inspired from a, a few papers that you can find in the literature where cathode luminescence is used to actually measure the diffusion length of charge carriers in a, in a system because approaching an emitter, you can see the increase in the luminescence coming from that emitter. And then it's quite straightforward to fit that increase with an exponential curve and then get from the X at the exponent in that uh, exponential curve, uh, the, the diffusion length uh, of the, those mobile carriers that are responsible for exciting your emitter. So this is exactly what, what we have done here. We have um, uh, our transition curves that I showed you before. And instead of focusing on the width of these uh, curves, uh, I focused on the steepness. So we take uh, just the increasing part of the curve where we approach the TMD edge and then I took the, 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 the exponent here to, to tell us something about the diffusion length of uh, the charge carriers that in HPN are able to excite the TMD luminescence. So you can do this again for all the curves that uh, you acquire, for instance, and then uh, distinguish according to the thickness of HPN. And you obtain uh, this uh, graph where you again have this effective diffusion length as a function of HPN thickness. And now we see that we have, uh, again, this linear uh, trend, but uh, we have uh, an almost one-to-one -one correlation between the thickness of HPN and the effective diffusion length in the material. So this is another way to see the fact that uh, with uh, the thickness of HPN, we are effectively limiting the length that the charge carriers can travel in HPN. Or if you want, in other words, you can think that in the bulk, in a very thick HBN, charge carriers may be able to diffuse a much longer distance than what we find here. So with this understanding, we can also estimate at least a lower limit for the charge carrier diffusion length in HBN. We can take into account the size of the interaction volume that I showed you before, and we can estimate that at least charge carriers are able to easily travel a distance of about 200 nanometers in HBN. So this is the first way to set a lower limit to the diffusion length of charge carriers in HBN. I just want to stress one last uh, thing about uh, this uh, part of our study. We are dealing with a wide band gap uh, material, so HBN, but we don't need to use a uh, UV light excitation nor uh, UV light detection because uh, we have a convenient way here to excite uh, the wide band gap with uh, a broadband excitation from the electron beam, first of all. But also in detection, we rely on the detection of the signal from the TMD. So it's more in the visible near IR. So it's a quite a convenient way to study a wide band gap material without dealing actually with UV uh, light. All right. So, so far, I talked about uh, aspects related to spatial resolution and diffusion limited spatial resolution with our technique. But if you actually want to map a TMD, you also need to deal with the brightness of the signal, or at least the signal to noise ratio. So in the second part of our study, we wanted to focus also on this. And first of all, we realized that uh, changing the thickness of HBN for a given acceleration voltage, you can change how much of your interaction volume is actually included within the heterostructure. So you can effectively change how much energy you release in the heterostructure and how much you actually dissipate into the substrate. Um, this is quite easy to, to simulate, for instance. So you can just uh, uh, simulate how much of the overall energy you deposit in the heterostructure and have this uh, uh, ratio. And you see that increases almost linearly for an increase of, uh, an increase of uh, HBN up to about uh, a bit more than 100 nanometers where we have uh, then the a constant. So this is a way to talk about the excitation power that uh, we can tune 
uh, tune in the thickness of HBN. But even more than that, probably you're interested in the actual light of the brightness that you can extract. And this is the reason why we also ran uh, numerical simulations to study the transmission of light across the top HBN layer in the HBN uh, TMD heater structure. So what we observe is that uh, the HBN encapsulation acts like a, a, a lossy cavity in some way for the TMD emission, because we observe this a modulation of the brightness of uh, the transmitted light. And um, we, we observe that, for instance, the first maximum of transmission is again around these values that are very close to about 100 nanometers. So now we could put together these two pieces of information, the graph on the left and on the right. In particular, let's take uh, this uh, uh, dashed line here, because this is the energy at which we have the excitonic peak of MOSC2 at low temperature, just because this is the material that we use the most in our study. So this curve, I put it back again here in this uh, blue plot, where we just have the modulation of the transmission of light across the uh, top uh, HBN layer. And then if we merge this curve with that modulation of the excitation power that I showed you before, we end up with this uh, black curve here, where we have a first increase in uh, uh, the overall uh, brightness that, that we have, and then uh, just a sort of constant value around uh, that is uh, mildly modulated by the transmission um, that we simulated. So these two aspects together change, uh, we can see them as a sort of prefactor for the overall cell intensity that we can have from the system. And we have essentially an increase of brightness for uh, an increase of uh, HBN thickness. But at the same time, if you remember uh, the first part of the talk, we know that uh, for any increase of HBN thickness, we are actually reducing the spatial resolution of our mapping. So we have these uh, two uh, counteracting aspects to consider. So we can say that uh, we can use these to give some uh, uh, practical working interval for HBN thickness if your goal is to do mapping of uh, TMD uh, encapsulated in HBN. So in particular, if your goal is to increase the brightness, you want to go towards thicker HBN. So you go towards 100 nanometers because for, for a given, always for a given acceleration voltage, because uh, beyond that, you don't really have a much of a gain actually. So if your goal is to increase brightness, let's go for thicker HBN. If on the contrary, your goal is to increase the spatial resolution, then you want to go towards thinner HBN to increase that spatial resolution. But at some point you will hit a limit in the weakness. Uh, you will have a signal that is too weak. So we realized that for instance, around 40 nanometers of HBN thickness, you are already at about 25% or so of the maximum signal that you could get. And um, you are already well beyond the uh, diffusion limited uh, spatial resolution that would come from, for instance, from uh, uh, far field uh, optics. So just in practice, we see that quite often 40 nanometers is sort of the lower limit to do um, easily hyperspectral mapping of uh, TMDs. So I just want to show you a couple of last uh, uh, slides where I try to corroborate our approach. So um, I'm showing here some older data of uh, hyperspectral maps uh, of uh, cathode luminescence of uh, a TMD monolayer, in this case, WSC2. And the goal here, what I want to um, stress is just that uh, we are able with this technique to highlight different subregions uh, in the same flake uh, where we have an enhancement. For instance, if you look here in this blue circle, we have this curve. We have enhancement of uh, some sort of uh, lower energy emitter. Uh, lower energy peaks uh, compared to the uh, relaxed uh, main excitonic peak of WSC2. And in other regions, we actually observe that uh, the, the signal from a uh, uh, red shifted uh, main excitonic peak uh, becomes stronger. So the goal here is to tell you that uh, with uh, this technique, we are actually able to combine both high spatial and uh, high spectral resolution so that uh, we can distinguish different sub-micron regions where we have different forms of heterogeneity. 
And thanks to the spectral resolution here, we are able to distinguish if those sub micro regions depend on the fact that we have a shift in the emission of uh, the main peak, maybe because of a strain or some difference in the, the electric, um, or other parts uh, where we have an enhancement of uh, lower energy peaks that may due to some localized uh, defect uh, that localizes uh, some different forms of uh, um, bound uh, excitons, for instance. So I'm not claiming anything specific about the origin of this. I just want to make clear that we are able to distinguish this and further experiments may clarify what we observe. Um, and yeah, I'm running a bit uh, out of time, so I don't want to spend it long, but again, we have several hyperspectral mass where we observe these. And in particular, we even observe that uh, these sub micron regions that we are able to distinguish may have borders that are not always uh, well defined. Sometimes, like in this uh, green curve, they're super sharp, really sharp and uh, very well localized. In some other cases, they are much broader. But yeah, in, this, in the interest of time, I don't want to uh, talk more. I just conclude here. Um, I've shown you that we can quantify in a quite convenient way some aspects of charge carrier dynamics in, a, in HPN using cathode luminescence. I, I've shown you that we have a certain control on uh, aspects, important aspects to do mapping like brightness and resolution. And eventually I tried to corroborate our approach with actual hyperspectral maps where we can distinguish different forms of heterogeneity with a very good spatial resolution, definitely beyond the diffraction limit of far field optics. With this, I thank you for your attention. I thank all the people that helped me and collaborated with me to do this work and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for this nice talk. So we have some time for the questions. Yeah, thank you, Luca, for a very nice talk. I have a very short uh, question. Uh, how have you chosen the value of uh, accelerating voltage? Uh, I mean, this uh, 3 kV, why exactly that uh, number? Yeah. So yeah, th yeah, that's a good point because uh, it's a sort of arbitrary choice if you want, but it came from a, a practical um, a practical uh, constraints if you want. So it's um, we can obviously do a study at changing the acceleration voltage, uh, but three, uh, what you usually want to do is to stay pretty low with acceleration voltage so that your interaction volume is uh, as small as possible. And three kV is a very, let's say, common value, easy to, to use to align your, your uh, SEM. So um, it, it's mainly for practical uh, reasons. On top of that, I may also add that uh, as long as the thickness of HBN is not going to the um, multiple hundreds of uh, nanometers, uh, which usually is not the case when you study encapsulated the TMDs, um, the acceleration voltage may not be the most important aspects in the sense that uh, the uh, especially the lateral size of the interaction volume is really much smaller than uh, what we think is the diffusion length of uh, charge carriers in HBN. So it's a kind of a less uh, strict uh, parameter to focus on somehow. Okay, thank you. Another question from the audience. Thank you for the nice talk. So my question is more or less related to your last slide where you show the tungsten deselenite. Uh, first question, how thick was the HPN on top and below? And second is you mentioned that we need further experiments to say what's going on in, in that region. If it's, I don't know, doping strain, whatever. Did you do maybe some such experiments like maybe Raman or conventional PL far field spectroscopy because the area seems to be large enough to do like far field experiments on it? Yeah, right. So here, I think that uh, we had a thickness. Um, it, it, this was a quite a, let, let's call it a regular sample in the sense we didn't go towards the very thick uh, HPN uh, that we did uh, just for uh, our study. So I think that we, I'm pretty sure here, we were well below 50 nanometers for both uh, top and bottom layers. Um, so relatively thin HPN uh, compared to the overall range of uh, our study. And yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, we, we can combine these, for instance, 
let's assume that this uh, red shifter, this is about 50 millivi in red, shift, red shifter of the main uh, peak. Um, we could do uh, Raman with a lower spatial resolution, but maybe we could be able to map the, the Raman uh, signal into the CL signal and have this uh, overlap and maybe understand if this is due to strain, for instance. Um, what I find difficult sometimes uh, is actually to do the correlation. So there's a, I would say uh, there's plenty of different uh, uh, phenomena that may cause a similar um, um, uh, redshift, for instance, and uh, uh, it becomes a bit uh, difficult to distinguish each of them. But this is totally feasible, and uh, I think that again in practice the main constraint is to have a, a way. So, for instance, markers that allow you to go back exactly to the same region with different techniques, so that you can have a um, multiple uh, multiple techniques to approach uh, uh, the same uh, um, phenomenon. Okay. Do, do we have more questions? If not, let's thank Peter again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. And we move to the last talk of this session, which is also about PMD, which is going to be given by Panayot Zote from the University of Chicago. So, Panayot. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen. Are you connected? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So, please continue. Uh, so, um, hello, uh, my name is Penny Odzotov. I'm uh, from the University of Sheffield and I'll be talking about um, using transition metal dichalcogenides in a sort of uh, a different approach than uh, previous, than a lot of previous work is, and that's to use them as, uh, as materials for resonators. For fabrication of resonators. So, um, first of all, to start off with the sort of um, uh, motivation, we we all know of uh, different types of uh, photonic cavities, the different types of resonators that have been used in the past for, say, per cell enhancement of emission of, of different types of emitters, such as uh, micropillar cavities, which are formed by DBRs, photonic crystal cavities of different forms, or uh, or whispering gallery mode resonators. And uh, they've achieved uh, varying success uh, with, uh, with even uh, from actually from the University of Sheffield, uh, a report of per cell factors as high as 40 for uh, a 3 5 quantum dot. Um, uh, what uh, uh, my work focuses on is uh, me resonators. So they're much smaller in size. And uh, in the past, plasmonic uh, types of plasmonic versions of the me resonators have been used to enhanced single photon emission, specifically in, say, uh, tungsten diselenide emitters, single photon emitters, and in other uh, material platforms. Uh, but these, uh, these uh, plasmonic, these metallic structures suffer from uh, emission quenching due to the fact that the, uh, 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 the charge, uh, the created excitons will, uh, will dissociate and, and transfer into the me metallic layer. And uh, any kind of uh, resonator, uh, any kind of me resonator formed with uh, uh, metal will not host any magnetic resonances, which might be interesting for studying uh, some, uh, some properties of, of another material. So in the past, uh, we've actually shown that we can use dielectric me resonators to uh, enhance the uh, uh, quantum efficiency of single photon emitters, specifically in tungsten diselenide again, so in TMD. Uh, where we uh, achieved uh, a quantum efficiency enhancement by, uh, by a factor of five on average. And um, so going off of this, uh, this sort of use of dielectric me resonators for enhancing single photon emission, um, uh, uh, what, what, I, what we propose under walls materials in this regard to make nanophotonic structures. So uh, the, uh, the advantages being that uh, van der Waals materials have a very high refractive index and a transparency into the uh, uh, visible and um, uh, near infrared range. Um, the, uh, the adhesion to, sub to the substrate is governed by the van der Waals forces that uh, track the single layers in the material. So uh, that allows one to transfer these onto uh, 
any kind of uh, uh, substrates such as uh, dielectrics, metallics, even nanostructured substrates or, uh, or flexible membranes, things, uh, things like this. Uh, there's a wide choice of materials that we can use with varying band gaps. Uh, and we can apply uh, lithography, standard nano, nanofabrication lithography and etching to these materials, as you can see here on the right, uh, uh, a recent report of this. Uh, and then there are uh, other more uh, recent works that can show that uh, the, van der, the weak van der Waals forces can be used for more than just uh, adhering to a substrate, but uh, dynamic tuning possibilities. I'll talk a bit about that in the uh, in the next in the future slides. So uh, what what uh, we worked on is fabricating these uh, uh, single nanopillar antennas. Uh, we used the crystal uh, uh, etching and isotropy to fabricate the uh, different shapes. So uh, we can use a uh, uh, use all dry reactive ion etching to, to form these uh, uh, these structures, but we can, for, uh, we can fabricate basically circular, hexagonal, or square structures, as you can see in the images in the middle. Uh, let me show that pointer. And we uh, basically use the, uh, the fact that the uh, etching mechanism will, uh, will selectively uh, etch uh, one crystal axis, uh, one crystal axis faster than the other to form these structures. And we, uh, we managed to measure uh, uh, very sharp uh, vertices in the, uh, in the square and hexagonal structures down to, uh, down to about 10 nanometers in some structures. So uh, we characterize these with uh, these uh, so-called monomer uh, nano antennas with dark field spectroscopy. And uh, we uh, observe basically several modes that, uh, that are present in the structures, including uh, scattering resonances such as the electric dipole resonance uh, and, uh, and other non-radiative resonances such, such as the anapole or higher, higher orders of this anapole mode. And uh, we sort of confirm this with simulations, FBTD simulations. Uh, telling us that this is in fact what we uh, what we observe and experiment. So uh, move on to the monomer idea uh, and move to this uh, dimer structure, which is basically putting two two single nanopillars close to each other. Uh, we use uh, tungsten disulfide in uh, in our work, um, and basically when when two monomers are placed very close to each other, the resonances will hybridize and split in energy. Uh, as you can see here, for a reduction in gap, the uh, the uh, the dark field spectra will will split into this x polarized and y polarized mode, the uh, which are the new resonances of uh, of the structure. And uh, interestingly, it will uh, confine uh, the electric field to regions outside of the structure. So there will be hotspots of electric field intensity at the edges of the structures. Uh, is surrounding the, the structure itself. So what, uh, what we do then is to utilize this, uh, uh, this um, confined electric field is to uh, place, uh, place a monolayer of tungsten diselenide on top, uh, which will be in contact with the tungsten disulfide uh, nano antennas, the, the nano dimers, and uh, uh, therefore will be uh, in the hotspots of the uh, of the electric field and uh, may, uh, may couple to the photonic resonances, may end the uh, uh, PL emission from that monolayer may be enhanced. And this is actually what we see here. And this is a PL image to the left of, uh, of the monolayer, which we have transferred onto our tungsten disulfide dimers. And we see that the, the emission is brighter for surrounding the nano antenna sites, which are in this array as compared to say a flat silicon dioxide uh, substrate. And here on the right, we've taken, basically we've, uh, we've measured the dark field spectra from uh, each of these nano antennas that are singled out and are sort of exemplary for the, uh, for the arrays. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, the uh, scattering cross section will overlap to a varying degree with the PL uh, measured at, uh, at each nano antenna site. But each nano antenna site leads to this much brighter uh, and uh, a much brighter PL uh, than uh, compared to silicon dioxide, which is shown in black here. Uh, so 
Moving on, uh, just a couple of definitions to say how we um, quantify the, the fluorescence enhancement, so the PL enhancement in, in our case. Uh, this is uh, by uh, defining this enhancement factor, which is taking just the emission from the nano antenna uh, and uh, normalizing it to the excited area, which is the area of the antenna, and then comparing that uh, to uh, measurement done on a flat silicon dioxide substrate in order to get a basically an enhancement factor. And then we, we can also define this through simulations or through, through theory to be dependent on three factors, which is the, uh, uh, the excitation enhancement, which is basically a measure of how well the material will absorb due to an increase in, increase in electric field intensity uh, in the vicinity of the monolayer. Uh, the quantum efficiency enhancement, which is, uh, uh, is uh, dependent on uh, on mostly the Purcell factor for a low quantum efficiency uh, source, uh, as tungsten diselenide has been proven to be. And uh, the last is a collection efficiency enhancement, which is just a measure of how well uh, the underlying structures will change, uh, will enhance the uh, emission in, within the collection objective, so within our setup. So, uh, we have, um, I show here the simulated results compared to the experimental. The, on the left, the first three, uh, the first three figures show uh, simulations of the electric field intensity, which governs the excitation enhancement, the Purcell factor, which governs the quantum efficiency enhancement, and then the enhancement of the collection efficiency, uh, which show that uh, it, it is uh, very possible to, um, to tune the each of these single factors using the nano antenna size and therefore uh, shifting its resonances to different wavelengths uh, and therefore leading to lower or higher um, electric field intensities and Purcell factors. So when we multiply these together and compare them directly, the experimental and, uh, and uh, theoretical enhancement factors, we see that uh, this is also tunable and uh, uh, of course, our experimental factors fall far below the theoretical as uh, the monolayers will, uh, will uh, not only emit from, uh, from very high electric field regions, but from others as well. And, uh, and the transfer of the monolayer is, is not guaranteed to uh, spatially overlap with uh, all of the hotspots of the, uh, the uh, resonances of the dimers. Um, but interestingly, as we measure the lifetime uh, of the emission of the tungsten diselenide monolayer, we see that uh, the emission from the nano antenna sites shows uh, uh, shorter lifetimes, basically indicating a Purcell enhancement. And uh, if we were to assume that the monolayer was 100% uh, efficient, so uh, any excitation would be uh, would be uh, would give a result in PL, then uh, we could estimate these. Uh, Purcell factors shown here below for uh, the different nano antennas. However, as we know that the non-radiative component of the lifetime is, is dominant in this case, these are only lower bounds to the Purcell factor, which may be quite, quite a bit higher. Uh, now, interesting, another interesting uh, point to make is that the, um, uh, the nano antenna two shows the shortest lifetime which, uh, which uh, backs up the, uh, the claim that the uh, theory makes, which is that the Purcell enhancement is actually quite tunable with the nano antenna. Um, we, uh, we vary the polarization of our excitation, thereby accessing the different, uh, uh, the different uh, cross-polarized uh, modes, so the X-polarized and the Y-polarized modes. And we measure the, uh, that the intensity uh, uh, for the X-polarized mode, the intensity from the monolayer is uh, slightly higher, and uh, the lifetime is slightly shorter. And we've seen this happen for all of the antennas, basically, that we've measured. And uh, uh, this is of the dimers as the electric field intensity is expected from simulation shown here again, uh, is expected to uh, uh, increase for the X-polarized mode. Going on from that, uh, we, uh, we noticed that we, uh, we discovered some, uh, we observed some uh, anapole modes in our tungsten disulfide nano antennas. 
which are these non-radiating modes, uh, which actually show, uh, similar to a previous report, show uh, indication of strong coupling as, uh, as the mode approaches the neutroic stun line in tungsten disulfide, uh, which is this anti-crossing shown here in the, uh, the higher-order anapole mode and slightly for the anapole mode. But this, uh, this non-radiating mode can be used for enhancing the electric field inside the, uh, the structure. Which is very, uh, which is interesting for nonlinear optics, basically. So we take uh, uh, three uh, dimer nano antennas uh, and we measure their dark field spectra, which show dips in uh, in these positions here with uh, with the varying radius, and uh, we simulate the uh, electric field intensity uh, or the electric energy, sorry, the integral of the electric field intensity inside the structures and observe a peak. Uh, to coincide uh, with the uh, with these anapole modes, uh, confirming their uh, their anapole uh, nature, uh, and we uh, subsequently use this to enhance uh, second harmonic signal, second harmonic generated signal. Uh, we see that uh, uh, on the left here, we measure from the from a monomer nano antenna and a dimer nano antenna much higher uh, second harmonic signal, uh, and. Uh, a bit higher for the dimer as it's uh, two, uh, two nano antennas close to each other. And we also see that the, uh, that the second harmonic signal basically and the enhancement of the second harmonic signal is polarization dependent for the, uh, for the dimer structure, which basically means to say that the, uh, 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 the uh, enhancement will depend on the excitation polarization because the uh, electric fields will be confined outside the structure for the x-polarized mode and inside the structure for the y-polarized mode, thereby leading to more or less uh, second harmonic uh, generation. Now, uh, uh, after having fabricated these structures and studied them and seen that they have some uh, photonic resonances uh, to which we can couple uh, 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 monolayer tungsten disulfide emission, we, uh, we realized that the smallest uh, separations we can reach with nanofabrication is 50 nanometers. So the gap size basically is 50 nanometers. So we aim to improve this by using uh, an atomic force microscopy uh, method uh, to use a cantilever in, in contact mode and uh, slowly collide with the uh, nano antennas until they detach from the substrate and, uh, and shift along uh, the direction which we are pushing them. So basically here we show that we can take a, a, an as fabricated dimer nano antenna with 110 nanometer gap and uh, rotate it and bring it closer together to reach a 10 nanometer gap, uh, which is then confirmed by uh, dark field spectra. So why is this interesting? Um, the gap distance uh, is very important for the electric field intensity uh, hotspots and decreasing the gap uh, leads to higher uh, electric field intensities. And this is due to, uh, due to basically boundary conditions on the parallel and, and perpendicular components of the electric field as these two are, are brought together. So we see that here we simulate uh, 10 nanometer gap structures for the three different shapes. And we see that the electric field intensities are, are um, three orders of magnitude higher than in vacuum. And uh, if we were to simulate a dipole that is positioned at the top surface of this nano antennas, the Purcell factors it would experience basically would be uh, up to uh, higher than 150, almost 160. So basically bringing these, uh, uh, bringing these together is very important for uh, high Purcell factors uh, in order to reach these high Purcell factors and mere resonators. Uh, so we also study we we'll study the uh, gap dependence. So if we were to increase the gap back to, uh, back to larger than 50 nanometers, we see that both the Purcell factor and the electric field intensity exponentially decrease. Uh, and therefore, can, uh, this can be used to modulate that enhancement. Uh, and we also introduce another method of modulating that by rotation of individual nanopillars, which uh, can be used for the square and hexagonal structures. Uh, which can be introduced through this AFM repositioning or through a clever use of the etching and isotropy and, uh, and the crystal symmetry shown here in the SEM. 
uh, which uh, basically shifting the centers of the, of the uh, structures of the individual nanopillars will form a new, uh, uh, a new dimer axis which, to which the, uh, the, the pillars are rotating. Uh, lastly, we studied uh, uh, optical trapping, uh, uh, a, a simulation of optical trapping using these structures, basically, which is, uh, which is dependent on the electric field intensities, uh, which, can be, uh, which can be found in these uh, ultra small gaps. And this is interesting as it can help us to position, uh, say, quantum emitters into these hotspots where they will be then further uh, enhanced by coupling to the uh, photonic resonances. So uh, basically, in the top simulations, we simulate the position of a particle in the gap uh, moving along the z-axis. And we see these uh, very high uh, trapping forces under 10 milliwatts per, per micron squared uh, excitation, uh, which, uh, which are much higher than previous reports for, for dielectric nanoresonators uh, such as these and therefore allow us to, uh, to uh, provide a, an application for positioning and therefore, uh, and, and further uh, personal enhancement of, of quantum emitters. So in conclusion, uh, I've shown uh, that we can fabricate uh, bulk tungsten disulfide into monomer and dimer nano antennas into different geometries using uh, the crystal anisotropy. Uh, dark field spectroscopy will, uh, will, has revealed these knee resonances to which we can couple uh, monolayer tungsten diselenide emission and achieve Purcell enhancement. Therefore, these uh, nano antennas uh, do function as, as they should, as nano resonators. Uh, then uh, some non-radiative mo uh, non modes, such as anapole modes, can be used for second harmonic generation experiment uh, enhancements and basically any kind of uh, uh, nonlinear optical experiments which, which rely on the electric field intensity. Um, and then we have uh, uh, repositioned, uh, using an atomic force microscope, we have repositioned dimers to uh, gaps which are uh, down to 10 nanometers, uh, which yield uh, electric field intensities uh, of orders of magnitude higher, should be 10 to the third, sorry, and, uh, and Purcell factors uh, above 150. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we have simulated these optical trapping forces, which can be used to, uh, to position uh, quantum emitters on, on top of these nano antennas and experience Purcell, the, the high Purcell factors. So last, I'd like to uh, thank all the funding agencies and my collaborators from here and, uh, and our external collaborators in York as well. Very much, I know you're very interesting and clear talk. So do we have questions? Do we have time? Uh, thank you for a brilliant talk. Uh, I have uh, the question concerning the origin of uh, second harmonic generation in tungsten disulfide uh, nanostructures. So yes. this uh, hexagonal tungsten disulfide should have um, the center of symmetry. So uh, does the second harmonic uh, generation originate from the some uh, surface defects uh, or it has some another origin? Likely, likely it has uh, several origins. So uh, like you say, it's a central symmetric crystal, uh, which, uh, which should lead to no, uh, no second harmonic uh, generation in the dipole limit. However, it could be that we have some emission from, from the top, say, surface or the bottom surface of the, uh, of the material, or we could have uh, emission due to the, the quadrupolar element in the, in the second harmonic generation. So basically, which is dependent on the electric field times the divergence of the electric field, which is, uh, which is uh, modulated based on this, uh, on this uh, anapole mode. So it's, it's changed quite a bit. So increasing the, uh, the divergence of the electric field basically might yield some second harmonic as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a, a question in terms of the the anipole anipole mode. Yes. So why do you call it an anipole mode? I re I read some articles mentioned that uh, 
it's uh, just about uh, a state which is caused by the interference between two resonance nodes. So could yeah. you give me the reason why you call it a mode? Is it uh, related to the bound state uh, in continuum? Uh, no, it's it's uh, it's basically the interference between two modes, as you say, and uh, it's a destructive interference in the far field. So it, it's it's a mode, and the fact that it uh, will confine the uh, the electric fields uh, to in, within the structure. Uh, but that's that's basically the reason why we define it as such. So it's it's a way to confine the the light you you send towards it into the structure, and then. Uh, allow applications such as this nonlinear uh, enhancement. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Do you have further questions? If not, please thank the speaker again and all the speakers in this session. Thank you very much. Now we have the break of half of an hour and then see you in the next session.
Hola, sí, probando uno, dos. Sí. Hola, esto es una prueba. Sí, probando. Hola, sí, probando. Hola, uno, dos, tres. Hola, sí, probando uno, dos, sí, probando uno, dos, sí, probando, probando uno, dos, sí, hola, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, sí, probando, hola, uno, dos, tres, bienvenidos, se oye el eco. Hola, bienvenidos, estamos aquí. Hola, uno, dos, tres. Starts to approach. Okay, got it. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, in this phono resonance regime, what happens is there are, you know, there are two pathways and then they interfere. And this happens when the coupling be between the, you know, between let's say in our case, exciton and the plasmon. So the exciton is a two, le two level system, plasmon is a quasi continuum. Uh, and in, 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 in the limit of in, in intermediate coupling regime, as you can see, the line shape basically starts becoming different from the individual components. And we have this asymmetric line shape and that, you know, that's what is phono resonance. So this got us excited that indeed that you know there could be a way of creating polaritons, exciton plasmon polaritons in these materials, uh, and which is you know, so by improving the design, we basically showed that indeed you can create exciton plasmon polaritons in these materials, and interestingly because of this open geometry by changing the size of the individual particle, which is which basically means by tuning the LSP of the individual particles, and the array uh, geometry of the array, you know the, the lattice dimensions. Uh, you know, and so on and so forth. One can tune the electron, uh, the exciton plasmon coupling systematically. So that was very exciting. But as I said, one very interesting attribute of these materials, of these low dimensional, two dimensional materials is because of the inadequate screening. If you're able to add any excitation, like, you know, carriers or remove the excitation, then that starts to influence, in principle can influence the uh, exciton plasmon coupling strength. So this is what we did, given the ease of the geometry of these systems, because these are two dimensional systems, you can integrate very easily uh, in a transistor type geometry. So we have a 2D material pattern, the plasmonic lattice, everything is fabricated in a transistor type geometry. There's a back gate, uh, poor transistor, because you know, the idea was not to optimize the transistor. So we were able to inject, we were able to inject and remove carriers. And what we showed was just by, you know, just by adding charges, uh, electrons to the system, we could basically go from a strong coupling limit with the A exciton. And then as we inject more and more carriers, a new branch starts to emerge, which, you know, which we identify close to the, you know, the trion uh, uh, resonance. And then as we inject more and more carriers, the original exciton resonance, basically the anti-crossing disappeared. And we had this very strong, you know, not very strong, but strong interaction with the trion. So if you plot basically the whole coupling strength as a function of gate voltage, which basically means carriers that we inject. So we start with the strong coupling with the free exciton, A exciton, and systematically it goes down and eventually we go to weak coupling limit. Uh, and, and for the trion, it goes from you know, no coupling, 
no observed coupling to something which is in the intermediate coupling regime. So you know, the idea is that given this very interesting material that you can, you know, if you do this with a, any material which is slightly thick, you know, even something which is five or 10 nanometers thick, you know, one would have to do something more dramatic because the gate effect is mostly at the interface of the oxide where the gate voltage is applied. But because it's a monolayer of you know, material, you know, there's no place for these you know, excitations to hide. So they're forced to interact. And because of weak screening, the influence is very strong. So that, that, that's, that's what the idea was. And then, uh, and this basically, you know, what the experiment that I'm going to describe now, it's a simple, ex relatively simple experiment, which led to this uh, whole idea of uh, topological uh, systems that we engineered. So we started to also look into, so we started to ask this question, what if we, in the, in the plasmonic field, what if we start to increase the number of excitons in the system? So in these 2D materials, in a, in a, this very, in, because these are crystals, if you start stacking these uh, 2D materials, uh, the, the spacing between the van, through the van der, Waals, van der Waals gap between the two layers or three layers is very small. So the, you know, they can sense the whole plasmonic field. So what we found was something very interesting. As we went from monolayer to bilayer to trilayer, we started to see emergence of a new mode. And this is basically marked by this red line. And we saw very strong, you know, uh, of the order of, you know, more than 100 MeV uh, uh, exciton plasmon coupling. But interestingly, what we saw was this new mode which emerges, which is rather dispersionless, which is flat. There's this, this region, white region, because it's reflectance measurement. So it basically means no excitation is allowed in the system. So we call it a band, you know, polaritonic band gap. And this, this is the upper polariton branch. So without getting into the details, the reason why this was happening, what we found is, hap is happening is, because there's very strong, the number of excitons in the system is increased and there is this periodic lattice. So there is this uh, plasmon mediated, periodic plasmon mediated exciton exciton coupling. So excitons in different regions, they start to couple and form this collective mode. So, and which basically gives rise to this uh, flat dispersionless uh, uh, polariton. So it's, it goes beyond the single, you know, you know, single exciton uh, system to, multi, uh, to exciton exciton interactions. So, you know, but the important thing was we, this emergence of this band gap in this material. So this got us started to think, you know, it, it, you know and which I'll describe in detail. Uh, can we utilize this band gap and invert the system and start creating topological exciton plasmon polaritons? So as of now, we have failed in this, but you know, at least this got us started. And, and then we changed the design to go into this photonic regime because you know, plasmons are lossy. And uh, now we are getting back to this problem with new materials, new, new engineered materials. So hopefully I'll have a new story to tell you know, by next year or so, hopefully. So before I get into this, uh, the main topic of my talk, which is uh, topological polaritons, just a brief, very, very quick brief overview for those who may not be well-versed with you know, topology in, 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 in in these systems, in condensed matter systems. So uh, the idea of topology in condensed matter was pretty much, you know, uh, this, this whole idea got introduced with this experiment called the quantum, uh, you know, quantum Hall effect, uh, where, you know, you, you have, you have a, you know, it's a, it's a conventional, uh, it's a conventional Hall effect uh, type of geometry. You have a two dimensional electron gas, you apply a very strong magnetic field. Uh, you, you apply bias in one direction and you measure uh, conductance in the, in the transverse direction. Okay. And what they found at, at strong magnetic fields, they found these uh, transverse conductance plateaus. Okay. And these conductance plateaus were highly quantized. And even if you change the state of the system at slight amount of disorder or you know, do something slightly different, these conductance plateaus would not change. So they're very, very accurate. And that, and that was, you know, at that time, Typically, you know, transport, electronic transport in systems is understood based on resistance, collisions. And this did not make sense because you change the state of the system slightly. Why would these conductance plateaus be so, you know, be exact and not change? Of course, if you, if you mess up the system, if the perturbation is very strong, you will break this, but, you know, within reasonable limit, this was very intriguing. So this led to the idea there must be something which is protecting the properties of the system. And this basically led the idea of you know, going from local parameters to global parameters. And this is, the, this is where the idea of topology got introduced uh, into condensed matter systems. Uh, so, and then there are these you know, topological invariants which describe the topology of the system. And depending on the nature of the system, if it's one dimensional, two dimensional, or what you do, 
Uh, there are certain topological invariants like exact phase, winding number, churn number, Z2, which is you know which becomes sort of important for quantum spin hole effect. Uh, you know, as, and th th these ideas start uh, you know, started to get uh, introduced. But another important aspect is the bulk edge correspondence. Correspondence. So what happens at these conductance plateaus is transport is not through the bulk but at the edges of the sample, and the properties of the edge transport is completely determined by the bulk. Okay, so it's not that they're uncoupled, but the transport is only at the edge. So this, you know, this basically leads to bulk, bulk edge correspondence uh, and edge states. So the importance of geometry, uh, the importance of topology was, you know, in, in geometry, geometrical systems has always been appreciated in math. Yeah. You know, yeah. So the idea, and in condensed matter, you know, one, one can make analogs and that's how it works. So you can define with, which is the, you know, let's say in, in, in geometry, there's this thing called genus. For example, if you have a sphere, it has no holes. So if I transform this sphere continuously without punching holes or, or reconnecting you know, any two points, so I can, I can make a disc, I can make a rod, I can make anything from a geometrical perspective, you know, they're the same from the topological perspective. But a donut has one single hole. So it has genus equal to one, let's say. And you can calculate this from the, you know, uh, gauss bonnet theorem. So you can make a cup, you can make a donut, you can adiabatically, tra adiabatically transform, uh, that's the key, into different, uh, different forms, but the genus remains the same, and so on and so forth. So the idea of, so this can be expanded to Hamiltonians of electronic systems. So the idea is for an insulator, if you adiabatically transform the insulator into different, you know, adiabatically transform into different, you know, different ways, uh, then the system remains in the same topological phase. However, if the system closes a band gap, uh, you know, if, if, if the band gap closes, then one can have in principle a topological phase transition. And then after that, you can enter a different topological phase. So what, what my colleagues, you know, my distinguished colleagues here in physics, Charlie Kane and Jean Mele realized uh, that one can also get these topological phases in electronic in condensed matter systems without applying a magnetic field. And they did this via, yeah, by, by, by utilizing uh, the spin orbit coupling, strong spin orbit coupling in certain materials. So what happens in, in conventional materials, um, or topologically non-trivial uh, materials, I mean, although they're not trivial by any means, like for example, cadmium sulfide, or any other semiconductor, trivial semiconductor, you have this particular ordering of bands. So one, one has these uh, uh, conventional ordering of bands, and let's say that has a topological invariant, let's say zero. But if you introduce spin orbit coupling and the spin orbit coupling is very large, then you can mess up the ordering. And then you can have what is called band inversion. So you know, the bands that are supposed to be higher in energy or above the Fermi level can become lower in Fermi level and vice versa. And when you have that system, and of course certain symmetries have to protect you know, this inversion, uh, then one can have a topologically non-trivial phase. And they characterize this by what is called a Z2 invariant. So, uh, and when you have a material or a system which has a particular topological invariant, let's say trivial system, Z2 is zero, in, and, and, and interfaced with a material with Z2 equal to one, let's say topologically non-trivial system, and it could be a topologically non-trivial system with vacuum, because vacuum is a regular you know, insulator. Then at the edge, because you have to transition from Z2 equal to one to zero, the band gap has to collapse. So that leads to formation of these uh, metallic edge states given by linear Dirac type dispersion. And uh, one way to think of this is these uh, is this is basically a quantum hall effect, but you have two copies of the quantum hall effect. And what happens is you have two edge states where, where you have spin momentum uh, locking. So electrons with spin up move in one particular direction in one channel, and the electrons with spin down move in the other direction, opposite direction. Uh, so this is you know so you can think of this as two copies of the quantum hall effect. Overall, the time reversal symmetry is maintained, and that that's one maintains this, uh, this cross crossing. So you don't gap out this crossing unless you apply a magnetic field. And this is what is called the quantum spin hall effect. So, so people have been trying, you know, and there's a lot of great activity uh, to, to mimic this in photonic systems, phononic systems, and so on and so forth, and to create new phases of optical matter. So one such design of this uh, quantum spin, it's not the only design, but very, very interesting and important design was uh, proposed by Wu and Hu in 2015 where the idea is you use this uh, honeycomb lattice, a photonic lattice, and create these uh, photonic orbitals. And then by changing the geometry, so the idea is in this hexagonal symmetry, you can either expand 
or contract these hexagons. And uh, so you start with all these photonic p orbitals and d orbitals, and you can write you can write the Hamiltonian of these systems, it's, uh, of the honeycomb system. And what they found was, and what they proposed was, if you have a regular honeycomb, like a graphene, then you have a Dirac crossing of these photonic bands. And if you expand or contract these, uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, these rods or these cylinders, these disks, uh, then you can basically take the system from a trivial, so you can gap out the system because you break a symmetry when you expand or contract. Uh, so going from expanded to contracted system, these are these correspond to, correspond to two topological phases. Okay, one is trivial, you have the regular ordering of the band where P, of, P photonic orbital is lower in energy and the D orbital is high, high in energy. And when we invert uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the expanded one, then, uh, then the D orbital becomes lower in energy, D photonic orbital, and P orbital is, is higher. So that's the band inverted system. And at the interface of these two, if you stitch these two interfaces, one can have these uh, you know, interesting topologically protected states. And the time reversal symmetry is basically is a pseudo time reversal symmetry made from these spatial, spatial symmetries and the time reverse using the time reversal of the of the Maxwell's equation. So yeah, so here, you know, so we start with the you know these hexagon lattices, okay, and you have these hopping, you know, hopping terms within the hexagon, outside the hexagon. So a regular honeycomb lattice gives you a direct dispersion. And by expanding or contracting, basically you change the hopping parameters within the cell and in between the cell. So uh, when T1 is greater than T2, uh, that's basically you contracted uh, the, the, these, the, you know, these hexagons. Uh, uh, the lattice remains the same, but the hexagon, these rods or these disks, disks are contracted. Then the intercell hopping is stronger than, intra, uh, uh, intracell is, uh, hopping is stronger than intercell. Uh, so this is basically, one can think of this as this SSH model, which is a trivial phase. And in the other case, the intra, in, as you can see, the, 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 the two hexagons between the two cells are closer. So this hopping is stronger than intracell. And that is the other, that leads to the other phase in the SSH model. So it becomes the topologically non-trivial phase. Okay, I'm gonna skip all these. So yeah, so he, these are the band structures. So this is the hexagon lattice. So you have this Dirac dispersion. Uh, this is the uh, the trivial uh, phase where the, where the where the dipolar p mode uh, p orbital is lower in energy. This is the d orbital is higher in energy, and in the topological phase in the expanded case, the dipole uh, the uh, the quadrupolar d orbital is lower in energy, so it is band inverted. Okay, so we created these structures. Uh, so if you wanted to create an exciton polariton using quantum spin, spin all effect, a uh, quote unquote you know quantum spin all effect of photons of, of the optical system. Uh, then we then we realized we had to do this in the visible range because most excitons live in this re regime. So we created uh, from silicon nitride these uh, these photonic crystals, these hexagons by contracting contracting them and expanding them. So in the contracted regime, this is the trivial phase. So the p orbital couples to the far field, so the lower band basically is lit up, and the d orbital at least at the gamma point is dark because it does not couple to the far field. And in the expanded phase, we showed by these Fourier space microscopy. So you can see the gamma point is dark. Uh, at the, at the, you know, so this is the d orbital, uh, d, d photonic orbital, and this is basically this is the this is the p orbital. So it's lit up. So the bands have been inverted. And when we create an interface between these two lattices, non-trivial and non-trivial, uh, in the linear, uh, if you shine light, uh, linearly polarized light, we see the two the two edge modes uh, you know, propagating. Uh, an upward direction and, bottom, uh, and, and, and downward direction. But if we shine right circularly polarized light, we only see one uh, topological mode uh, lit up. So basically light is propagating in one direction. I'll show the real space image also. And in the other opposite circular polarization, we see the other one. So in real space, this is what, what it means. So we shine light at this topological interface. If it's linearly polarized, light propagates in both directions, but it can still nav navigate these very sharp bends without backscattering. But if we shine right circularly or left circularly polarized light, then, then we can make light propagate in different directions. Okay? And they can navigate these very sharp turns because you know, in order for, for the mode to backscatter, the spin, the spin degree of freedom has to, you know, has to, has to, has to flip. And that's not easy, okay? unless, unless you put a mirror somewhere. So this was the photonic regime. And photons are very interesting, of course, and we can make all these things. But you know, photons don't interact with the environment. You cannot apply electric field. You cannot control them. Temperature doesn't change much uh, because the refractive index of the material changes very slightly. So if you want to make an actively tunable system, you know, you know, in, in, in incorporating materials degree of freedom, like for example, excitons would help. 
And this, this leads to the idea of topological uh, polaritons. So one of the first breakthrough demonstration of topological polaritons uh, was reported in 2018, which was the quantum Hall effect. So you apply a very strong magnetic field, you have a Zeeman split, but this basically works at very, uh, very low temperatures because the Zeeman splitting that you get is very, very small. So it works, it works at high, high fields and small temperatures, but nevertheless, a beautiful demonstration. So we thought, can we, can we make a quantum spin hall effect analog of, of these polaritons uh, and, and, with, and, and make it operate without magnetic field and at high temperatures, hopefully room temperatures. But the question was, so our design is the following. So excitons are provided by 2D material. And then we couple with the topological lattice that as I described, but the question is under the strong limit, uh, will we open a gap and make it trivial? Will, can we make something topologically non-trivial? So we have, to, we have to play with certain symmetries. We have to pick up the material which does not break the symmetry of the underlying lattice and other considerations. So th these are some tight binding calculations which basically showed you know, uh, uh, that indeed, um, it, at least in principle, one can get an inverted system and, and a topologically non-trivial system. So I'll describe this in more detail. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, just go, uh, I'll just go straight to the experiment because that's... So what you see here is a photonic lattice. To, uh, so one side you have this uh, non-trivial uh, trivial lattice, the other side you have a non-trivial, topologically non-trivial lattice, so you know, contracted and expanded hexagons. This is the edge, edge state. Uh, this is the stitch between the interface between the two uh, lattices. And then this gray area is, is WS2 integrated on top, a monolayer. Okay. So we measure the band structures of, of this by using Fourier space microscopy. And you can, basically what happens is under strong coupling, this basically splits into two Dirac cones and we have this, uh, we have this uh, region. So this is in the bulk, you know, either here or here. And at the interface, and these are the band structures of the bulk. And at the interface, when we measure the dispersion, left and right circularly polarized light basically produce two topological polariton modes of which basically, you know, correspond to Correspond to, two, uh, correspond to the two helicities of the system. So indeed experimental and theoretical analysis matched. And these are the real space images of the topological polariton. And these experiments were done at 200 Kelvin, so it's pretty high temperature without applying any magnetic field. So, uh, so this is the dispersion in the, in the photoluminescence that we measured. So this is the bulk band and uh, right circularly polarized light basically lights up one topological uh, interface mode, uh, which basically means uh, propagation of this polariton in one direction. And the other uh, topological, uh, other circular polarization basically lights up the other topological branch with, with the negative velocity compared to this. Uh, and then in real space, this math, this corresponds to, uh, to polaritons propagating in the other direction. And since uh, you know, these are topologically protected systems, so what happens if we, you know, if you make a sharp bend? And what we found was indeed these polaritons can navigate these very sharp bend in the waveguide without any observable backscatter, significant backscattering, or at least we could not measure the backscattering. So what we have is a very nice topological, a new you know, phase of optical matter, which we call helical, helical because the transport is dependent on the helicity of, you know, of light. So as I said, you know, these are uh, exciton polaritons, can we manipulate them? So the first experiment we've done is simply with temperature. So just by changing the temperature very slightly, what we have shown is the system still remains in this topological phase, but the group velocity can change by orders of magnitude. Okay? And that's very significant. And what we are trying now is to integrate this design of electrical tuning. So we can electrically tune these topological polaritons uh, by applying uh, a gate bias. So it's slightly more challenging because we have these suspended membranes to put the electrodes, you know, the gate electrode and all is challenging but we are making good progress in, uh, in, 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 in making this. So I guess I'm running out of time. So I want to end with this idea and putting together what you know, my group has been doing uh, in other, uh, other directions also. So where can this be useful? So one of the vision that we are uh, approaching is, can we make an integrated chiral nanophotonics infrastructure, but everything on a chip? So just like in electronics, you know, conventional electronic devices, the entire circuitry works basically by measuring the current that flows in the circuit. You know, transistor turns on or transistor turns off. So you only have two states, uh, but, or you can have more states, but the point is the, you know, the distinguishing factor is the, the number of electrons flowing in the circuit. But in spintronics, the idea is that one can encode more information in electron spin. So can you do something with light? 
So if you have photonic circuits, most photonic circuits right now work by measuring the amount of intensity of light that flows in the circuit. So, but photons also have more degrees of freedom. One is, you know, spin, polarization, left and right circularly polarized light correspond to spin one and spin minus one. But also, you can also endow with extrinsic degrees of freedom like the orbital angular momentum. So, yeah. So people are you know, making great progress in creating opti optical communication channels by creating these spin orbit coupled photon states, waveguides, and also detectors. But they use bulk optics, you know, like room full of optics to do this. So can we do this on a chip? Can we create you know, materials and systems which produce light with very specific spin and optical angular momentum states, waveguides? and also detectors that can detect this coupled system. So this is my last slide. And we've made some very good progress recently where working with my colleague here, Liang Feng, uh, we've shown that we can make all these la on-chip lasers uh, with, with, which, which we can tune the emission with both spin and orbital angular momentum states. I've given an example of a topological waveguide, polaritonic waveguides, which can be actively controlled, but right now sensitive to only spin, you know, spin polarization. And we've also, uh, last year we also reported detectors, on-chip detectors with one shot measurement that can detect uh, the orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum mode of, uh, of, of light. And people thought this was impossible to do this using photocurrents, but we can do this by using non-local fo non photocurrents, uh, which go beyond the electric dipole approximation. So with this, I come to the end of my talk, you know, and this is the vision that we are building with. So I'd like to thank, you know, all the people who contributed to this work, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much for this uh, very nice uh, talk, very nice overview and all the possibilities with topological polaritons. Other questions? The audience, I don't see so far. Do we have something in the, in the chat? Actually? Hello. Um, is there, was was there a question? I'm I'm not able to hear the question. Oh, it's in the chat. Let's see if I can read the chat. So oh, okay. So the question is, can this be useful for quantum computation? Right. There's one question. Oh yeah. Perfect. Great. Great. Answer is From, exactly. Uh, this is what we are trying. Maya. Okay. Can this be useful for quantum computation? Yeah. It's a great question. So people have. Yeah, you know, in bulk optics, people have endowed single photons with different orbital angular momentum mode, also and spin. So yes, so so my colleague is working on creating these uh, these on chip uh, on chip sources of single photons with these coupled spin and orbital angular momentum mode, and we are trying to push the limit of our detectors by taking them into a superconducting phase, but you know utilizing the same symmetry of the material to detect single photons in one shot trying to measure the orbital and spin angular momentum of single photons. It's a great question. So it's a work in progress. Thank you. Good. Any more questions? No? Uh, yep, we have a question from the audience. Hi, <clears throat> thanks for the nice talk. So uh, uh, one question, what is limiting the propagation length here along these channels? I see like 10 microns roughly. Yeah, great, great the question. Plasmonic uh, propagation. Or, 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 or the topological polariton part, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, since we had to characterize the dispersion of, yeah, you know, and get the bands and all. So, this, this, this was designed to have uh, everything was folded at the gamma point uh, so that we can measure because light has to couple out. Otherwise, how can we measure the dispersion? So, that, that, that's the biggest uh, loss mechanism. So if if we if we do the valley hall uh, uh, polaritonic insulator type thing, where 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 this the same thing can be folded back to gamma k and k prime points, which will not couple to the far field. So then the propagation length should increase. So right now the biggest loss mechanism is uh, purposely done so that we can measure because we need photons to come out to measure the dispersion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then I think uh, yeah, um, we should uh, move on. Time is running. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And we come to the second talk.
curve is actually the bent curve, and it will be given by Louis Ray. And the title is Quantum Internal Structure of Plasma. Okay, first of all, I, I want to thank the organizers for making possible this workshop. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, 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 the, the, the internal structure of many body systems, in particular, the quantum geometric dipoles in two body systems. In, in, in two cases, in, in, uh, I'm going to, to focus in two cases. One is the exciton. And I'm going to show that they have, they could have some internal structure, which can produce some uh, strange behavior when you apply one electric field. And, in, in, then I will talk about uh, the internal structure in plasmons. And also I will study what is the, what is going to, to be the relevance for studying the skew scattering of, of plasmons. And this work has been done in collaboration with uh, people in, Indiana University, Herfertig, and his student, Jill Yao Chao. So uh, the, the first is just to justify or just to give a hint of the reason for studying this problem. And, and the reason is just, uh, just remembering what is the concept of magneto exciton. So we know that we have a, a 2D electron gas and we apply a strong magnetic field and the temperature is very low. You have a Landau levels, in which uh, have a high degeneracy. So under some circumstance, you can uh, uh, fix the chemical potential between two Landau levels, two different Landau levels. You have uh, this, uh, all these Landau levels are fully occupied. Those Landau levels are empty. So the a question is, what is the, the collective excitation in the system? What, is the magneto exit on the system. And it's possible to make a, a exit on in the system just combining one electron in one, ocup, sorry, one hole in one occupied Landau level and one electron in one empty Landau level with uh, giving a momentum to the system. And then you have this uh, magneto exit on wave function. This has been worked out 40 years ago, in particular by Cathy uh, Kalinibert Halperin. And, and they were able to obtain analytical expression for the excitons, the wave function, and also the energy. And the interesting thing is that when they analyzed the exciton, they saw that they have the expectation value of the, uh, the different imposition between the electron and the hole. So the dipole of the electron and the hole is proportional to the momentum of the exciton and is perpendicular to the momentum. So when one exciton is moving in, moving in one direction with momentum in K, the separation between the electron and the hole perpendicular to the momentum increases. Okay. And, and this um, is uh, an internal property of this uh, exciton wave function. And due to this internal property, Kalman uh, uh, Halperin found that the dispersion of the, magneto, of the magnetic, magnetic excitons have some funny structure with, intern with interesting physical properties. So uh, also they, they obtain that when the, the momentum is very large, the energy of the exciton is just E squared over the separation of the electron hole pair. So it behaves at E squared over K. So this is something that uh, we are going to, to show now. We are going to study and to show that this is this property of the magneto exciton, which is known for 40 years, is just due to some geometrical property of the wave function. So it's, it's something that is, is of the internal structure of the wave function. And even more, we are going to find that this uh, dipole moment in this exciton also can appear in cases where you have no magnetic field. In particular, we are going to show that it could happen in plasmons and also in, uh, in uh, interlayer excitons. Okay. So, before starting studying the, the geometry of the, the two-body system, I, I'm going to remember very quickly what is the concept of very phase in, 
in solid state, in, in the band structure. So we know that you have a crystal with a periodicity, just due to block theorem, the wave function can be written in, in this form, where this UQ is periodic in the crystal. So every is you change the unit cell, the, the wave function is periodic, and this phase is moving along the crystal, it is not periodic. Okay. The interesting fact is that uh, this uh, wave function u satisfy this uh, er Redinger-like equation, where q belongs to the Bridgman zone of the crystal. And we can consider q as a parameter, and then we can make some transformation of the wave function when we move in the Bridgman zone. And then just to the, uh, the, the thing that happened is that the wave function u q is going to get a phase to make one uh, a closed circle in the Bridgman zone. And this phase is the uh, is the is called a, a berry connection, and is determined by this uh, a of q, which have this expression. A of q is not is not phase invariant, so it's very similar to the vector potential in electrodynamics. But the important quantity is just the the quantity omega q, which is the very curvature. And this very curvature is going to be very important for the dynamic of electrons in the, in the band. Now, the, if you take into account this uh, very curvature, the velocity of one electron is the derivative of the dispersion, but it has some correction, which is proportional to the cross product of the electric field and this uh, very curvature. And that is, is, is important and, and has very important consequence. And we are going to, mention, going to mention two cases. One is the quantum hole effect. In the quantum hole effect, you have Landau levels. So there is no dispersion. The disper this dispersion is zero. So the velocity of the electron is proportional to this product. So it's going to be perpendicular to the electric field. And then when you zoom, you can, so when you compute the whole conductivity, it's going to be finally the integral of this very phase is going to be quantized. And it's going to be determined just by the, this topological uh, object. But there is a, another, another system that is, is nowadays are also has been studied. It's is the system which are governed by this kind of uh, 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 gap the Dirac equation. So you have a two by two Hamiltonian where you have a gap and you have hyperbolic dispersion is parabolic in the top and the bottom of the bottom of the band and then becomes linear at higher and lower energies then in this in this case just again due to this kind of dispersion you obtain that there is a whole conductivity in the system if the chemical potential is here in the gap the system has been commented before is just uh, you obtain the quantum anomalous hole effect and the whole conductivity is quantized to one, one over two in units of phi squared over h. But also when you move in the, in, in the bottom of the conduction band and the top of the balance band, you have some anomalous hole effect, which is not quantized, but is finite, okay? And this is going to be important for the dynamics of the, of the, of the electron. So this is for one electron. Now the question is what happened if you have two electrons, one electron and one hole? Okay, in that case, the idea is just to write the, the in, uh, in this case is for one exciton, you write down the, the wave function as a function of the position of the electron in the hole, and there is this the momentum, the total momentum of the exciton. Now you want to define some, some, uh, some space, some parameter space where to have some closed path in the system. So the thing you, you need finally is to write a wave function which is periodic when you move the electron and the hole at the same time. Normally, the people that the thing that do is just to define this wave function. So if they um, strip off this phase, okay, in such a way that this is periodic. And in this form, you obtain the Esteton Berry curvature. This has been studied by, by New in, in the 2008. And there are a lot of papers who study the, the, the band structure of the esteton and the topology of the band structure of the esteton. But this is the on, not the only possibility. The thing we, we, we propose is that we can define 
this wave function u, which is periodic in the unit cell, so you can move the electron and the hole and we obtain a periodicity. And we, the, we separate the phase between the electron and the hole. We kill different ways the electron and the hole. There are two possi clear possibilities and important. One corresponds to alpha equal to one. So we take out the, the phase just of the electron. Alpha equal to zero, we take out the phase of the hole and alpha equal one half, which correspond to this uh, very curvature. Again, we obtain some very connection for electron. I, I mean, we get a very connection for electron and very connection for the hole. These quantities are not gauge invariant, but however, the difference between A1 and A2 see, is gauge invariant. So it has, it, it has some physical meaning. In particular, and this is uh, the, the one important conclusion, we can, Prove that this, the difference between the position of the electron and the hole, which corresponds to the dipole, is equal is when you make the, the, the transformation of the position of R1 in this form, is equal to the difference between the um, uh, very connection of the electron and the hole. So we found that the dipole of the exciton is something internal of the wave function, and we call quantum geometric dipole. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, when, when we analyze again, the case of the magneto exciton, when we, op we look for the wave function of this magneto exciton, we compute this quantity, the uh, quantum geometric dipole, we obtain of course that this correspond to the cross product of the momentum and, and C. So this is the same dipole that uh, uh, has been obtained from the magneto exciton. But it's important to know that this related with some geometrical property of the exciton. And there is another case where this, uh, uh, this uh, dipole appears. And uh, this corresponds to the case, suppose, of, of uh, an uh, uh, interlayer exciton. So we have uh, two materials, one on top of the other. Um, each material is going to uh, just govern it by this uh, two by two Hamiltonian with this. Uh, for example, in the case of TND semiconductor, the simplest description. And we look for the estitone between one hole in one material, one electron in the other. We make the calculation. I'm going to escape all the details. I'm going to show the result. We minimize the energy and we obtain this coefficient of the wave function. And then we can compute this geometric dipole. We obtain those two important results. One is that. Uh, we have a geometric dipole, which is uh, linear in the momentum of the exciton, and it's perpendicular to the direction of the momentum. So it's the, it's the same kind of behavior that the magneto exciton, but here there is no magnetic field. The reason why I appear this behavior is just the internal very structure of the bands. Okay. So we have some uh, magneto exciton for this dipole, and then the next the next question is what, what is the conclusion? What is the, what is the importance of the magneto exciton? In order to do that, we had to look for the dynamic of this exciton. And the thing we, we did is just, you, we create a wave packet of the exciton, enter it at some momentum in KC. Okay? And we look for the dynamics, the classical dynamics, just looking for the Lagrangian and so on. And we obtain this, uh, this uh, dynamics for the exciton. Um, and the, the important quantities is R plus is the, the position of the electron part plus the position of the hole. And these are the electric field uh, acting to the electron, the soon of the electric field acting on the electron and the hole and the different of the electric field acting on the electron and the hole. And all the dynamics is just uh, appear here in, the here in the dispersion of the exciton. Here appear the, the very phase of the exciton and here appear the quantum geometric dipole. There are two important cases. One is the case where the electric field in the electron and the hole is the same, and the electric field uh, in, uh, is, is constant. Okay, so E minus is zero, so that means that the velocity of the momentum is zero. We assume also that uh, the velocity of the, uh, sorry, velocity of the momentum is zero, this term also is zero. If we are in the, in, in the bottom of the band, this quantity is also zero. 
So the conclusion is we obtain that, that we have one exciton if we apply one electric field, the field is going to have a deep velocity of the, of the exciton. Okay. The other possibility is just to have different electric field acting on the electron the hole. This could be possible because they are uh, interlayer exciton in different layer. So in that case, we obtain that the momentum is going to, to increase with the electric field. And the thing that is going to happen is that the electron and the hole are going to separate until finally they become uh, ambiguous. Of course, probably the electric field we need to, to, to apply is very, very large. Okay, so that's what's for the, for the case of the exciton. And I'm going to comment what happened with the plasma, what we can expect in the case of plasma. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the first thing I'm going to define the, the, the Hamiltonian, the system we are going to study. Again, this is the, the, the this semiconductor band structure with the, this gap. And we assume that the, the system is doped. And also we assume that the chemical potential is much larger than the gap in the system. Okay. In this situation, the dispersion of the electron is given by delta, which is basically the value of the gap plus some quadratic dispersion. So it's basically a standard semiconductor. However, it's important to note that if you are in, in the bottom on the conduction band, you have a curvature, and that associated with this curvature in the, in the, in the dispersion of the electron, you have some very uh, curvature, which is given by this quantity, okay? So it's maximum for a small values of Q and then decreases, okay? So this is the, for, for the band structure. And then we need to obtain the plasma. We are, we are looking for the internal properties of the wave function. So we know that the plasma are basically electric field confined in the, in, a, in this case, electric field confined in a two-dimensional system. And the dynamics of the electric field is going to be determined by the optical conductivity of the system. But, it's possible to write also uh, the wave function of the exciton, and it's going to be created by this operator acting on the, on the ground state of the system. And in order to have a collective excitation of the system, uh, the, this commutation relation had to verify, and this is basically the RPA approximation. Okay. When we do that, we obtain after some algebra, of course, we obtain the, the wave function of the plasmon. We depend on the total momentum of the plasmon, and we obtain also the dispersion of the plasma. The dispersion of the plasmon is the standard dispersion of, of, uh, of two-dimensional electron gas with parabolic dispersion. It is not different. But the band structure is different. Okay. This is shown here, where um, I'm going to plot the square of the uh, uh, plasma wave function as, as a function of the internal position, the relative position of the electron and the hole. In the, in the left, I plot the case with, where there is not very phase in the band dispersion. I just take it out, so I have only parabolic band. There is not very phase. And this is the, the, the square of the wave function, which is elong, elongated along the direction of the momentum. This is the, the thing one expected for a plasma. And now the thing that happened is that when we introduce the very phase in the dispersion of the electron, this uh, wave function is shifted perpendicular to the moment. And this shift is going to, is, is finally is related again with the, um, the quantum geometric dipole. And this is the thing I'm going to prove in the next transparency of which is rather trivia. So again, I, I compute the very connection for the electron and the hole. I uh, from this wave function after some algebra, I compute the dipole of the plasma and I obtain this expression for the dipole of the, of the plasma. Again, the, 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 the dipole of the plasma is perpendicular to momentum. Okay, so it is the, the plasma, the, the dipole increase, increases with the absolute value of the momentum and is perpendicular and alpha, it's a parameter which gives information about the very phase in the host semiconductor. So when alpha is zero, there is not a quantum geometric dipole in, in the plasma. But when you have a, a very curvature in the, in the band structure, you have a quantum geometric dipole. 
KF is the Fermi wave vector, which is basically the density of electron in the system. If the system is heavily doped, so the energy of the plasma will increase, all the quantum effect disappear, and this quantity also goes to zero. Okay? So these are the two limits. And uh, the question again is, well, what happened? How, uh, what is the experimental, the possible experimental consequence of this uh, geometry dipole? Well, you, if you have a dipole, one expect that you have a, a, a charge impurity, you are going to have some skew scattering. The simplest approximation is the Born approximation, where you have one impurity, and then assuming that the separation between the electron and the hole is, is small, as is in the case, the, the perturbation in the system due to this uh, impurity is given by this quantity, which is the difference between the electron and the hole, the position of the electron and the hole, and you obtain that the, the, the uh, impression of one impurity, you have a scattering from one plasma with momentum k to a plasma with momentum k prime, which is proportional to this quantity k times k prime. So uh, this is a, a, a skew scattering which uh, is not reciprocal and is, uh, is uh, asymmetric and could be relevant for some uh, possibilities. Of course, this is a Born approximation. This is not a very good approximation for treating the, the scattering of between plasma. This is only is going to give us some, some uh, underlying physics. We need to, to go beyond that. We need to treat this scattering beyond the Born approximation. So we that there is three, we found three different ways to do that. Um, one in uh, the in the physical reason to go beyond the Born approximation is that when you have one impurity, the impurity is going to modify the density profiles in the system. If you modify the density profile of the system, you modify the response function of the system. So you need to include the variation of the density in the system in first order. So there are three possibilities. One is to go to make a, one RPA, including all the variation and all the changes in the wave functions consistently. This in, is in this reference. And another possibility is something just uh, from the dielectric formalism. So the idea is, is very simple. So we now in the uniform, uniform system, the RPA plasmon are obtained from the zeros of the dielectric constant. But if the system is uniform, you have only one momentum k for the plasma. But if this quantity d of k is the Linkhart electric matrix. If you introduce impurities in the system, the system is not invariant. And this matrix, which is diagonal in k, becomes a matrix which is not diagonal in k, k prime. So in principle, you can have a scattering for one momentum k to one momentum k prime. And you obtain some kind of Lehman Swinger equation. This is interesting. We also described that in this, in this paper uh, by Cao, but also it's, it's, it's a formalism which has been obtained in 65 by three class. And also I did rediscover it in, in 2017. And finally, the other possibility is just to obtain the plasma scattering just using electric field and currents in some kind semi-classical calculation, which is the thing I'm going to explain in the next transparency. The idea is, uh, how much time I have? Nothing? Okay, so um, I'm going to just to say the result. The result we obtain is that we have, uh, sorry. We have, a, uh, we obtain some Lindman swinger equation where we have a scattering in between plasma with momentum k to momentum k prime, and there are two times in this potential scattering. One is the symmetric scattering due to the inhomogeneities and just due to the Coulomb interaction, or, or you, wish, you prefer just due to the modulation of the diagonal hole conductivity, and you have one asymmetric term due to the modulation of the whole conductivity in the system. In this system, in this component is asymmetric. Okay, thank you very much for your time. For the talk, um, we have questions for the audience. Maybe from the CPC, so we have eventually some questions. Yes. Okay. 
Sebentar. The scattered in the 2D system, sorry, in the plasmons in the 2D system that you consider, were you considering only one copy of one of the valleys? And if so, what happens with the other valley? No. This um, uh, macroscopically, you can see that the quantum geometric dipole is related with the whole conductivity of the, of the Hamiltonian, the system. So you have two valleys they have different whole conductivity and, process, and they have different quantum geometric dipole. So if they move, probably they cancel. One possibility is to have plasmon, which arrive to a modulation of the density, plasmon with both valleys occupied. And we arrive, for example, to a step in the density profile in the, in the system, uh, this plasmon becomes separated in one valley is going to have a scattering in one direction and the other valley is going to have a scattering in the opposite direction. Of course also, but this is far easy for a, for a theoretician to say that you can uh, just polarize, send light which is polarized and then only create electron in one of the valley but not in the other, but okay, this is probably more complicated. Okay, you described this theory for a gap system, no? And the question, since we are doing to the material, is uh, how difficult would it be to, re to have the same theory for graphene plasmons? How to get? The same theory, so quantum geometrical dipole, uh, etc., for graphene plasmons, so a gapless system. No, so, it is, it is, it's, it's not possible because uh, if you have a graphene. It's, it's a, it's a semi-metal. So in principle, there is no, even for one simple valley, you have no full conductivity. So you need to open a gap. If you are in graphene, there are several possibilities in theory. If one is just to put graphene on top of boron nitride, and eventually it could be possible to open a small gap, probably it's very small. Another possibility is just to play with the spin orbit coupling, just depositing graphene on top of a material with high uh, uh, strong spin orbit coupling to have some kind of spin orbit proximity effect. And another possibility is to put magnetic impurities. And there are some experimental groups which uh, claim that they are able to open huge gaps in, in, in huge several electron volts in, in, in graphene. Yeah. From my side, uh, do you see a possibility to directly measure this scattering? Pardon? Experimentally to measure this scattering? Do you see there any possibility? Uh, I, I, I mean, we can propose an experiment where, but of course, it's when it's not working. Uh -huh, no, well, okay, it's the same. So you, you can expect that it could be possible to have one antenna which create plasma and, one, and then this plasma is going to propagate and it could be possible to have a, one a tip to measure uh, the plasma and, and move the tip and see how it change the scattering as a function of the angle. So all it's very difficult, but okay, well, this is a proposal. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, speaker again. So I'm going to the um, third speaker, which will be online again, from Georgi in MO Live, and um, will speak about topological optical phase engineering and atomically thin transition metal like calcinite. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Just a second. Okay, so um, today I will tell you about uh, phase manipulation, efficient phase manipulation in uh, two-dimensional materials by uh, topology, but unlike the first speaker, which introduces very nice complicated topologies, I will use like the very basis of topology. So uh, to begin with, uh, we're all familiar with the conventional uh, optics. Um, 
for example, eyeglasses, like I'm wearing right now, and they work uh, usually on this, they control the optical wavefront on the surface of this uh, optical component. So they are quite bulky and their size is much larger than the wavelengths of light. Uh, luckily, we have metal surfaces which are introduced recently, and uh, they give the same effect as our conventional optics, but um, uh, the, the size is much is about the wavelengths of light, so they are quite improvement compared to the conventional bulk uh, optics. But of course, our ultimate goal is to use a two dimensional uh, material, first of all, because uh, their properties is easily controllable, for example, by electrical gating. However, uh, two dimensional materials face the problem that the uh, phase accumulation, which is uh, defined by just, uh, for example, uh, phase accumulation for two pipes thickness, uh, refractive index divided by wavelength of y, is uh, only about 0 0.01 of pi, which is much less than the pi. And each it actually uh, tells that uh, our two dimensional materials uh, devices should be should have efficiency of about several percent, like so it is just 1% of pi. And actually, it actually is the case for current two-dimensional devices, it's uh, only about several percent, and uh, in most cases, it's only 1%. And this is the reason for this. So we should come up with some idea how to improve this phase accumulation in two-dimensional materials. And uh, we come with the uh, like this uh, idea that, uh, for example, we can use uh, zeros of transmissions, reflection, or scattering signals. And because in the uh, at zero amplitude, we have undefined, undefined uh, phase, we should have um, a rapid phase variation uh, in the vicinity of these points uh, on the order of pi. So it's actually our goal uh, should be done. So we focused on a uh, reflection case. Uh, for example, with a stubborn silicon, silicon oxide stubborn, and here is a high refractive material, for example, like uh, graphene, moist 2, waste 2, palladium, selenite, or whatever. So, the idea is the following. So, you can uh, introduce the zero reflection surface, which defines what should be optical constants of our two dimensional materials, to give a zero, a zero reflection of the structure. And if you plot the real um, material dispersion, it will cross this uh, zero reflection points at several points, and um, these points uh, correspond to zeros of your structures. And uh, as you see, for example, I put this like a spiral white curve in the vicinity of uh, some Lorentz uh, peaks, for example, an excitonic um, contribution in TMDC, you will have like uh, two points like this one. So you actually wanted to have some strong response. Uh, and uh, these points corresponds to the phase, uh, topological phase. You can see here, we plot calculated the phase variation. It will be like, for example, here, the topological charge will be plus one, and here will be minus one. And uh, in these uh, points, uh, you will have the desired plus pi or minus pi for, uh, phase variation. So, to experiment and demonstrate this effect, we uh, use ellipsometry technique because. In the ellipsometry, you simultaneously measure the, the amplitude and the phase change upon reflection from the sample. And it defines as a reflection at p-polarization over reflection of s-polarization. So we have uh, our rp, for example, polarization equals to zero, your is equal to zero, psi is equal to zero, and uh, delta will define your phase variation upon the reflection. So we did the experiment. And you see, for example, for thin film of palladium disilinite, uh, this, this topological points of zero uh, reflections. And you see that indeed, in these points, we have a topological, uh, topologically mapped uh, phase variation. More interestingly, uh, these uh, points, for example, here, we didn't achieve an experiment uh, zeros and uh, due to experimental non-idealities, but uh, nevertheless, we have this uh, topological phase uh, um, because of the topological protections of our structures. So because of the intersections of materials curves and the reflection surface, which I showed. And here's the example for graphene, for example, for molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide, also the experimental and simulated uh, spectrum. So actually, you are not uh, constrained with only these materials. You can work 
is another one. And the most, uh, the bonus of this effect is also that you also have a side, uh, aside from uh, face singularity, you also have a perfect absorption. For example, it's a headache for, for working with the photo detectors to increase for the detection of graphene because graphene uh, only absorbs about 2% of the light. And so people did like, for example, here, photonic structures to uh, photonic crystals to enhance uh, absorption of the our structure. But uh, if you um, define uh, that your structure has zero reflections, so everything will absorb in your structure, for example, to, in two dimensional materials. So, and basically we derived the equations which differ for this case. And more interestingly, if we use, for example, a perfect electric conductor at the bottom, for example, metal in the infrared. So this equation simplifies and it's viewable for, for example, for photo detectors engineers, quite easy to find the conditions to satisfy perfect absorption in graphene, for example. So this is quite useful also for for detection purposes, but also you can use it for several materials you are, can work with, uh, for example, even with not uh, two dimensional uh, uh, metals like now, so like our own six nanometer, you can see points here, here. But uh, you may notice that why we choose podium diselenite as our primary choice is that because it demonstrates like numerous points, five points, for example. Uh, and it, actually, the reason for this case is that excitonic structure of uh, palladium diselenide that it's coincides with the fabricable resonances of our substrate. And because of that, uh, like I described previously, it's quite easy to cross the zero reflection points for these materials. And we have several points and several uh, wavelengths uh, and incidents. So we can cover like a very broad wavelength range in this material. So, and uh, you can use it uh, this in uh, numerous applications, for example, in holography. So you can uh, etch some uh, materials uh, and uh, uh, you can provide holography in the structure, but also you can uh, make optical differential based, based on this technique because actually as shown by uh, uh, Zhu, uh, you can, uh, you need topological charge to have uh, optical differentiator to Require edges of your structures, for example, in imaging. But uh, we focus on uh, biosensors because, uh, uh, as you will see, our, our structure is already a quite good uh, biosensor with the record sensitivity. And uh, like biosensors are now should be, uh, should provide some cheap biosensors because of the COVID situation. So we need some quick uh, analysis technique. So basically we covered, instead of air on top of our structure, we covered it with the uh, different liquids, liquids with the uh, different refractive indices. And you see that there is uh, the, the response of the structure in these liquids uh, quite familiar with the surface plasma resonances and it slightly shifts with the uh, change of the refractive index. But you might notice that uh, this shift is uh, very low and uh, spectral sensitivity is quite low because of topological protections. But if we uh, look not on the amplitude, but on the optical phase, you will see it will dramatically change. Even at the very small uh, change of the refractive index, the phase will grow up very rapidly. So and you can see uh, like this curve. Uh, ideally, it should be like stepwise, but uh, from non-ideality, so the uh, real world, uh, you will see this one. And the phase sensitivity is about 7.5 times to 10 to the fourth degrees per refractive index unit, which is quite high. For example, surface plasmon resonances provides uh, current like uh, recent results is only 5.7 times to the fourth and requires some sophisticated design. But here you just place your two dimensional materials on starting silicon silicon dioxide structure and you already get the quite nice by sensors and actually it also provides like a very um it could work with ever uh, very low refractive index change for example by uh 0 0.7 times to the uh 10 to the minus 7 power so uh, our device uh, also 
is very robust because of the topological protection. So the sensitivity almost unchanged after nine months of the measurements. So, uh, and uh, the change is only in the wavelengths of uh, our zeros is uh, 1.4 nanometers and the angle of incidence by one degrees, but still it's very small compared to the uh, time which we done the measurement. So our, our sensors is quite robust, scalable, cheap, uh, easy to use and easy to fabricate. And it's uh, based on the very simple topology uh, uh, idea and on very simple structures. So despite its simplicity, it provides like very pronounced results. Uh, also, we start to think how we can, we can see other topological effects, for example, charge annihilations. You can see if we change uh, thickness of palladium diselenide, uh, these two points with the different charges uh, go in closer to each other and annihilate at 3.2 nanometers. And you'll see in the phase, there is no phase singularity. So we can control the number of points by, by change of parameters of the system. And also we asked the question, someone could ask, so can we go to the higher order charges? And unfortunately we cannot. And the basic reason for that, is that near the reflection points, you can like uh, expand your uh, reflection in the Taylor series and uh, you can define it like, uh, like that. And it's basically it's Delta Z like that. So it corresponds to the topological charge equals to one. Uh, the topological charge have a non-trivial topological charge. Uh, your uh, reflection amplitude should be in that form. But uh, that form implies that your derivatives of uh, reflection points with respect to the lambda and to the respect to the angle of incidence will go to zero. And these equations actually tell us what should be optical constants of our materials, but these equations tell us what uh, will be the derivatives of the material curves. And it implies that it will intersect uh, only at one point. So we cannot have two intersections at the same point with the same topological uh, charge. So we cannot achieve high order charges. But uh, for example, we used uh, ellipsometry for by sensors. And in ellipsometry, we use uh, the ratio of Rp over Rs. So we can, um, for example, to increase our uh, sensitivity of the sensor, we can make that RP and RS will have the same topological charge at the same point, and it will give us high order charges uh, artificially, but still it will improve the sensitivity. So we use uh, our derived equations and provide the parameters of the system, which should give us uh, a topological charge equals to uh, plus two. And uh, for example, by P and S polarization to find such materials. But if we send further, we can use uh, anisotropic materials and uh, anisotropic materials even uh, provide much flexibility to these equations and we can easily achieve uh, also C equals two plus two. So, but for other high order charges, you need really some uh, more complicated structures. So uh, to conclude, we provide uh, very simple idea how to provide very but very efficient to face accumulation uh, as a demonstration as a practical demonstration we provide the record sensitivity of the bias sensors and we proposed the new concept of uh, how are the charges for example and uh, charge annihilation in these uh, structures uh, for details you can ask me right now or you can read our uh, articles published in archive right now and in the review and uh, finally i want to thank all my colleagues who contributed to this book for the amazing job and thank you for your attention thank you feel free to challenge me with your questions thank you very much for the nice talk the questions I may, I maybe have one question regarding the difference between uh, phase measurement and, and uh, intensity measurement. I mean, if you have a well-defined phase term, doesn't this require necessarily that you also have a well-defined zero, meaning that uh, the, this kind of uh, singular point should be equally well resolved in 
the phase as well in intensity. So I have not understood fully what is exactly the advantage of, of the phase. Uh, the advantage of the phase that, for example, you can uh, you, uh, actually, uh, yes, you're right, the amplitude will go to zero, but you can walk, uh, for example, uh, you can walk not at the zero point exactly, for example, for biosensing, we use at zero point exactly, but, uh, for example, you can go to, for example, to the right and to the left of the, your single points, and it will not give you the zero of amplitude, but it will give you a very decent uh, phase accumulation. So you are not working uh, exactly at the zero, but you go at that point, and at that point, and at this point, you will have the pi difference uh, and uh, not uh, zero amplitude. Did it answer? Did I answer to you, your question? More or less. Are there more questions? No? Okay, then uh, there are no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, we come to the last talk for today, which were given by Daniel Schumann. And the title is Dynamics of Optical Vortices in 3D Materials. Okay, can I start? Yes, okay, great. So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Yaniv, I'm a PhD student in Ido Kaminer's lab in the Technion in Israel. Uh, and today I want to present our recent experimental results about the dynamics of optical vortices in 2D materials. So uh, in this talk, actually, we have two points of novelty. The first one is uh, showing optical vortices, the measurement of them, uh, inside 2D materials. Uh, and the second one is to show dynamics of optical vortices that, as far as we know, was never measured in any optical setup. So uh, we managed to do these uh, uh, measurements using the uh, properties of 2D materials and the polaritons in 2D materials, and also a new experimental setup that I'll explain uh, today about, which is an ultra-fast transmission electron microscope. So uh, this work is a collaboration between myself and Rafael from uh, Ido's Kaminer group in the Technion, a Hanan from Frank Coppens group uh, in Nick for Spain, Jill Rosalind from University of Mons, uh, Belgium, and Professor Jim Edgar from Kansas State University. So let me start by an example uh, where you can find optical vortices. And uh, this was uh, presented by Zomalfeld back in 1954. And let's imagine a plane wave that moves uh, and is uh, having a scattering effect due to a semi-infinite fil thin film. So on the top, uh, very far from the thin film, the wave still propagates as a plane wave. Uh, and on the bottom, it creates a standing wave. And apparently along the way, there, is, there are points where the wave is actually uh, rotating. See, there are areas where uh, we have clockwise and counterclockwise uh, where the phase is accumulated. And these are in fact uh, optical vortices. And uh, Nyan Berry in 74 gave us a, a mathematical description of this effect. And this is uh, in fact phase singularities of light. So optical vortices are actually defined as uh, locations uh, in space where the phase is undefined. These are exactly these points in the center of the vortices. And it gets uh, optical vortices get integer values of optical angular momentum, which equals the uh, accumulated phase over two pi. So the top one has uh, OAM of minus one, the bottom one has OAM of one. And because the phase is undefined, uh, this, the uh, amplitude is forced to be zero. So these uh, vortices are located along this uh, nodal line in the intensity. Okay, so this is kind of a description of what are optical vortices and what can you do with them. Um, actually, it's a huge field uh, where there are a lot of advancements uh, in the past 30 years, especially uh, in related to paraxial beams, uh, where really notable achievements uh, that I can only mention a few. Uh, so optical tweezers, trapping ions, and stimulated emission depletion. Uh, but many more related to communications. Um, and the 
uh, all these uh, um, uses are very successful because uh, of the topologically protected optical angular momentum. So uh, if there is some perturbation to the system in frequency or in time or in space, the optical vortices remain uh, stable due to their uh, topological properties. So here uh, in these examples, it was presented using paraxial beams. And uh, let's talk what about non-photonic devices where the question is uh, whether we can see also optical vortices there. And the answer is yes, um, you can design uh, this plasmonic uh, surface with uh, really uh, delicately designed um, boundary conditions. And you can see uh, how uh, optical vortices uh, can be found. And since 2008, it was shown in many different um, structures. Um, and for example, you can see how optical vortices are created in this beautiful video by Spektov et al. So in this case, you shine light from above and uh, the slits are coupling in the light into uh, plasmonic or plasma polaritons that propagates towards the center. And you actually see in your uh, in this measurement, how the uh, light is rotating. So this is uh, optical vortex of plasma polaritons. And what you could do with it, uh, part of demonstrating them is actually quite a rich physics. Uh, for example, analogies of solid state systems or also doing a nanometrology um, or all the applications of uh, paraxial beams just in smaller. Um, and this not, not only uh, occur in plasmonic devices, also in uh, silicon photonics. So any modes of light that moves in the 2D plane. This was uh, presented by the Kuipers group where uh, they showed with chaotic boundary conditions, uh, many different effects. I want to emphasize one of them, which is processes of creation and annihilation of optical vortices in the frequency domain. So here in the bottom, you see in both circles, uh, there is total uh, orbital angular momentum of zero. But when they change the frequency a little bit, uh, they saw that on the top, two vortices of different signs are getting annihilated. And in the bottom, two vortices uh, are getting created. So the total OEM is zero. But when they change the frequency, they saw these processes of creation and annihilation. And uh, although there was such a, a large research about optical vortices, their dynamics in time, so their temporal, temporal behavior uh, was still never measured. So our goal is to bring the first observation of the dynamics of optical vortices, and specifically to see in time how optical vortices can be created or annihilated or see their movement in in-plane, just ask whether the topological rules are conserved in time. And we found that an excellent platform to answer these questions is polaritons uh, in 2D materials. So uh, briefly, uh, I'll remind everybody uh, the properties, uh, main properties we need uh, in order to show uh, the dynamics of vortices. So polaritons uh, in 2D materials, uh, uh, when I, I say, uh, I call polaritons uh, hybridization between a photon and some excitation uh, in the material, there are different types of polariton, plasma, phonon, exciton uh, polaritons that were all discussed today. Uh, and these modes propagate in the 2D plane. And many different uh, optical phenomena were shown in the recent years uh, using polaritons in 2D materials. Um, and for us, if we want to uh, measure the dynamics of optical vortices, we really need two important properties. The first one is to have relatively low losses. So we want some uh, optical mode to do a movement before it completely decays. And the second is uh, the second property, which is important for us, is the extremely slow group velocities. Uh, so we want that the shape of the light inside the sample would not move too fast uh, in order for us to measure it. Uh, and generally measuring the polaritons is quite challenging. So how can you image the 2D polaritons? Um, the problem of imaging them or probing the 2D polaritons is the fact that they move in the 2D plane. So you need somehow a scattering effect or um, 
uh, uh, other uh, mechanisms. Uh, the most common technique is uh, sca scanning near field uh, optical microscope. So you have a tip that moves along the sample and uh, due to the interference patterns, you can reconstruct the dispersion relations. Now, another uprising uh, system is to use electron microscope. So you have an electron, an electron beam that goes and penetrates through the sample. And after uh, it interacts with the field uh, in the sample, uh, it can spontaneously emit a polariton. And by uh, looking at the electron energy loss and its momentum change, you can reconstruct the dispersion of light or the, of the polariton. But not only that, you can use the microscopy techniques and actually reconstruct the whole 3D mode of the polaritons. Um, so in these systems, uh, you can probe the eigenmodes of the system, but you cannot really see dynamics. In order to measure dynamics of polaritons, uh, you need some time resolved system. So two pulses, one of them would excite whatever you want to see and the second one would probe and uh, enable to see it. And uh, these demonstrations are uh, really shown uh, interesting phenomena like uh, group velocities. But for us, if you want to see uh, vortices, the tip of the, um, the uh, scanning near field optical microscope is quite the problem um, because it, it creates another interference um, that we want to avoid. So this additional boundary condition is something that we want to avoid. In order to do that, we try to combine the different systems and we used an ultra fast electron transmission uh, microscope that we have uh, here in the Technion. So we combined a laser with an electron microscope. And in this case, what uh, is happening is we have a source of light, which is a pulsed laser, which is divided into two. One part of it goes and excites the sample, and the second is uh, exciting a tip of a, of a metallic tip, which releases, uh, due to the uh, photoelectric effect, a free electron that penetrates and probes the sample. And the theory is that the electron can probe the electric field along its trajectory. So if uh, the electron moves in, along the z-axis, it probes actually all the electric field uh, along its path. And this coupling actually changes its own wave function of the electron. So uh, when we look at the electron energy spectrum after the interaction, as the interaction is larger, the electron uh, energy getting different, um, different quanta. So you see that as G is larger, the spectrum is getting wider and wider. And then in order to do the imaging, we apply an energy filtering so that all the, uh, all the electrons that reach our camera are the ones that did interact with the electric field in the sample. And this technique was used in different uh, samples, for example, uh, looking at plasmonic nanorods. So in the small image here, uh, you see the electrons, the electron imaging without filtering. And with the energy filtering, you see actually the modes of light that surround the plasmonic nanorod. And it was demonstrated in many different uh, setups. Uh, and we were the first uh, previously this year to demonstrate uh, how phonon polaritons can propagate uh, using this technique. So how they, the wave packet propagates inside the sample. Um, so now I'll show you a video that actually sum up uh, the technique of doing this imaging. So we have a pulse of a laser that con is converted to the infrared and excite a wave packet inside the sample. But this same pulse is actually divided into two. And the top port uh, is exciting. This tip releases free electrons. Some of the electron are accelerated due to their interaction with the phonon polaritons in the sample. And these electrons that are getting accelerated, they can pass an energy filter. And therefore, we can image only them and image the light inside the sample. Uh, then we can change the time delay. So actually physically moving mirrors inside the lab 
And then we can have an image in a different time. So when we do this scanning over time delays between the two pulses, we can reconstruct the whole video of the movement of uh, the phonon polaritons in our sample. So this is uh, a work that was published previously this year, and we show their uh, extremely slow growth velocities and wave packet deceleration or wave packet splitting. Uh, and I really recommend to look at this uh, uh, recent paper. And now I want to uh, shift into this previous work of measuring the uh, 2D polaritons of, and the vortexes of the 2D polaritons. But before reaching the real measurement, we had to understand whether we could actually see or whether the 2D polaritons can support vortices. In order to do so, um, we simulated a squared sample uh, where a pulse of light is coupled in and excite polaritons in the sample. And what we saw here in specific time is the following. So the good thing about simulations that you can see both the amplitude and the phase. Um, and what we saw that indeed we can find optical vortices. Some of them are rotating counterclockwise and some of them clockwise. And these vortices indeed relate to zero uh, amplitude of the electric field, the phonon polaritons. And not only a single time scan, you, we can uh, look at the whole video. So on the simulation, we found that the light should couple in from all edges. Uh, and suddenly there are times where vortices are getting just created, annihilated, move in space, and wanted to understand what are the rules here uh, that we can follow. Uh, so we uh, have in the horizontal axis, the time, and we can follow each one of the vortices and find that it can annihilate or create in pairs, but also in a single uh, event. So a single um, vortex can get uh, created. And the rules are the following. Uh, we found that if there is some non-zero local minima in the sample of, of the electric field, uh, it can create, in fact, a pair of optical vortices of different signs. So this keep a uh, total OAM of zero. And another uh, effect is that pair can be created also along nodal lines. So if there are lines where we have a long zero, a long, uh, um, it connects the uh, red and blue dots, uh, another pair can be created along the line. And these two processes tells us that inside the bulk of uh, the HBN, uh, the OAM, the orbital angular momentum, is conserved um, in local events. But also we found the following uh, uh, mechanism that single vortices can get created or annihilated on edges and really seems like as if they move inside and outside the sample. Um, and this event actually does not conserve local uh, OAM and this is happening because of the reflection of the fields. So a reflection gives you an additional phase. And um, these are reflection from the edge of the sample. So still the light is moving in the 2D plane, but it has some additional reflection. Uh, and this changes its phase. And the change in phase, of course, uh, can uh, create or annihilate an optical vortex. So uh, now I can uh, go to the measurements. So in the measurement, we have a sample. It's not exactly a square sample. Uh, and this scale is five microns. And what we see is the following measurement. Now follow closely. Uh, we see these very uh, interesting patterns that move along the sample. Now let's break it down. Uh, so in the beginning, indeed, we see that the wave packets, it, it seems like there are four wave packets that moves inside the sample. Uh, and then after some time, we see that it's not like the wave packets, each one of them propagates freely. We see some interference patterns. And specifically, we see these zero points uh, of the field, right? And these zero points are quite stable uh, in time. But apparently, uh, we found also areas where another zero uh, can or is created, and this zero is expanding. Uh, or areas where 
um, zeros are moving. And these zeros are in fact optical vortices. Uh, so we have a whole automation of how we convert areas with very low counts into uh, optical vortices. And we see here um, these processes of pair creation and um, annihilation due to the exact mechanisms that we found before. Uh, and also we can determine what exactly is the sign of each one of the vortices according to the field uh, that they surround. So we have peaks and saddles, and we can really reconstruct uh, the vortices in each uh, point in time. And we did the same reconstruction for all our 93 frames. Uh, and we actually found exact same behavior as we have uh, in the simulations, where we saw this movement of the optical vortices and events of creation and annihilation in time. So uh, after these results, we asked ourselves, uh, where, let's go a step back and think about uh, the big picture here uh, in terms of uh, designing the sample. So if the sample is too small, then you could see samples that can potentially support vortices, um, but you could not see any dynamics of optical vortices. On the other hand, if the sample is too big, then the light is just propagating as a wave packet, um, but also, well, you see dynamics, but you don't see opti optical vortices because you don't see any rotation, you don't have enough um, momentum, um, directions of momentum. However, in what we uh, called optically mesoscopic samples, so larger than wavelength, much smaller than the decay length, uh, all these samples actually can support the dynamics of optical vortices. So we actually expect that many measurements that were done in samples could actually support optical vortices uh, with a, a correct probing mechanism. And uh, with this, I want to give, uh, to finish with a couple of points of prospects that we think uh, for further directions. So to utilize additional freedoms of 2D polaritons, for example, ask yourself what would happen in hyperbolic media or uh, in super lattices, um, whether we can add nonlinear phenomena. And the most, uh, let's say, uh, intriguing thought is whether we can have an optical analog also to uh, of uh, solid state physics. And there are a lot of uh, things that uh, relate to vortices in solid state physics, for example, uh, the BKT phase transition to relate that the total number of vortices. We actually see in the measurements some hints that we might uh, can do something. And uh, with this, I want to finish and thank you all for uh, remaining here in my last talk and the last talk of the day uh, and the organizers of uh, this conference that uh, enabled me to talk here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Are there questions? No, maybe then I start. Uh, so the, um, so far, uh, you, you can measure only uh, intensity images. Do you see any chance to measure uh, the phase or uh, at least get the phase via some phase retrieval method? Yeah, so- uh, really Visualize the vortices in, in, the, in the phase. Yes, yeah, so indeed, uh, in order to know uh, for certain that uh, these are, vortices without any doubt, although the simulation show exact same uh, amplitude, uh, we indeed, uh, the, knowing the phase is indeed necessary. Uh, and actually measuring the phase in uh, electron microscope is very challenging. And uh, it's currently uh, uh, some goal of many groups around the world. Uh, what you need to do in for electron microscope is to have actually two, um, some interference or two points of, uh, or two electrons uh, that do some interference. And then with some holography techniques, uh, you could reconstruct the phase. But so far, these are only uh, theoretical works. So achieving a probing of uh, the phase uh, using this technique is a really big goal that a lot of groups uh, are pursuing. Okay, thank you. More questions? No? 
no more questions. Okay, then I think uh, we thank the speaker again and uh, all the speakers of the session. So that uh, session is closed and uh, continue tomorrow. <laughs>